Let's do it. Oh, uh, yes. I'm streaming out to everybody on YouTube. So, um, putting the call out there to everybody. We're doing an uh, interview here in a few moments with the one and only Mr. Kev Baker on the Kev Baker Show. So, I figured we'd do a little bit of a restream. Um, get everybody involved. The BTV family. This will be good because some of the subject matter you're talking about, Chris. I mean, you've been there, you've been boots on the ground, you and Cherie, so it'll be good to have the, the visuals as well that you can probably add to yeah. this presentation tonight. And I'm super excited, dude. I'm stoked. I can't wait to get into it, man. Oh, we are too, for sure. It's going to be a lot of fun. So, Indeed. yeah, yeah. You know, actually being there is different than, um, you know, um, than just seeing it from away. I mean, being engulfed in the energy and all of that. So, yeah. I'll let you lead everything, though. No, all good, man. No, you got to take. You know, you got to take us. You know your audience. You know the the Kev Baker audience. So you take us where they want to go. It's organic. It goes with the flow, Chris. Okay. Absolutely, man. I was thinking maybe a good place to start though would be the the build up. What led you to taking on the mission of going to Egypt? Okay. Okay. If that's okay with you. Sounds great. Yep. Build it up nicely. Awesome. Awesome. What's Some of that footage that you were showing them, um, Chris Everard. I mean, the fact that he is so blown away by the work he's have done, that that adds a whole new level of um, importance. Because I didn't really realise the historic value to what you guys have really been doing by cataloguing all of this, Chris. That was kind of lost on me. I knew it was good. I knew it was really important stuff, but... That historic value, that, that takes it to a new level altogether, man. Well, flattery will get you everything, so. <laughs> it's true, because, I mean, I don't think a lot of people watching that will appreciate it, because we've seen so much, so many documentaries about the pyramids, all these monuments before, but it's almost as if we have a good knowledge of them, and yet here in the subterranean chamber that we're going to get into, I mean, I certainly didn't appreciate just how rare it is to get a look in there in the first place, let alone for you to share that with the world. Yeah, they locked that place down several years ago, and they don't, they're like, we're not supposed to be taking video while we're in there. It was only because we had the pyramid by ourselves that we were able to do, you know, get all this video. But they don't allow video when you're just visiting normally, and they don't allow anybody into the subterranean chamber, so there's nothing but old pictures from there. So, and the Queen's Chamber too. They locked the Queen's Chamber down. But we got full video of that, documented everything. The only thing is when we got to the King's Chamber, we were so pressed for time that we needed to do our ayahuasca ritual and we didn't document the King's Chamber as much as we would have liked to. And, um, but that's the only thing. And, and then the, um, the pyramid has this weird effect where it drains batteries. Uh, so they told me this before we went in that our batteries would be drained very quickly. Um, so we got, we got some video from the King's Chamber, but, um, that adds yeah. to the whole energetic kind of properties of the place for me, Chris. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, it, it's definitely a, a power plant. Oh, uh, I, I'm more convinced now than I've ever been. Absolutely. Yep. So. I'll add in the network. Excellent. Everybody joining us on the Beyond the Veil streams. This is Kev Baker show on TFR, TFRlive.com, the website. And, um. If you're not listening to the Kev Baker show, then shame on you. <laughs> Why, thank you, sir. We'll be happy to um, enjoying your streaming as well, Chris. You've got an absolutely lovely, slick layout, man. Good off for that. Good, good work. Awesome. We just have awesome. a good. We have a good team. Yeah, we do. And so Nick Zervos did the graphics and everything. And, yeah. Awesome. And that, that video you posted today of the wee baby. That is <laughs> Dude, I was for smiling us. from ear to ear when I saw that. I was like, and I didn't even ask permission of the person who sent yes, it. Yes, that I, was bad. It hit me afterwards, and I'm like, oh my god, I should have sent. I should have asked permission. And I wrote her an email, and Cherie said, no, 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 everything's good. So yeah, she said, okay. uh, she said, you know, I should be really mad about that, but I'm not <laughs> at all. Oh, <laughs> not mad at all. It's super nice. It really, really is. Yeah. How are you doing, Cherie? I'm doing good. How are you, Kev? Oh, super stoked to have you on tonight. Absolutely. This is going to be great. We're super stoked to be here. For sure. It's one show I get nervous when you guys come on. Oh, no that. reason to be nervous. No, We're more nervous no, I... than you are. <laughs> Nerves are a good thing. Yeah. Do you like my... That's my Wookiee that a listener sent me. 
Aww, I was wondering what that was. Yeah, I thought it was I'm a blanket cool. at first. <laughs> I've got a onesie. I should wear the onesie with the Wookiee. I'd look like I'm kind of related. It'd be Aww. A bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is going to be good tonight, guys. Really looking forward to it. And to everyone out there on the Beyond the Veil stream before we go live on KBS, big, huge welcome to all of you if you haven't heard the show before. And then um, you're going to like this. You really will like it. UVA students encounter protest. A white Chicago police officer charged with murder shooting a black teenager, Laquan McDonald, is telling the jury he opened fire when McDonald kept advancing at him, waving a knife. Jason Van Dyke said he kept firing because he was not certain he had fucked the team. <sighs> State Department says Secretary Mike Pompeo will travel to North Korea Saturday to meet with Kim Jong Un. Visit will also bring him to Japan, South Korea, and China. Hundreds of thousands of Amazon workers will be getting a pay raise next month. Amazon is raising its minimum wage to $15 an hour. On Wall Street, the Dow is up 142 points, S&P down 1, NASDAQ down 38. I'm Mike Moss. Wherever you are, make it, make it t t t Truth Frequency Radio. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. That is the dopest intro in yeah. the world, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a human being, God damn it. My life has value. This is all I know. I hereby declare this to be an unlawful assembly. Oh, is that what it is? Well, I, don't, I don't want you to buy like a little in your back number. He'll leave you alone. Yeah. Good works are done in light, so what's done in darkness needs to be brought to light. And it's up to us, uh, citizen media, to be out here and expose it. We will stand and fight. Seeking answers to age old questions. Deciphering the world painted around you by the mainstream media. This is the Kev Baker Show. And now, here is your host, Kev Baker. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, Kev Baker, and you're tuned in live to tonight's Kev Baker Show right here on Truth Frequency Radio, www.tfrlive.com. Now, a very special broadcast tonight for the very first time ever. The Kev Baker Show is simulcasting on tfrlive.com and over on YouTube as well. And we'll get more details about that in just a moment because that's not the only reason tonight's show is of high significance to me because the Kev Baker show has always been about almost my personal private journey. And I've shared it with all of you every step of the way. And like all of you out there, when we first realize that there's something wrong with the world, that, that voice in the back of our head starts nagging at us. And then we take to the internet and we try to find out what is going on. We've all been there. And there were two people in particular that played a huge role in all of this for me back at the start. And in no small part led me to where I am today. And even more synchronistic and to add to the entanglement of that, the two people I'm talking about just happened to be Chris and Sheree Geo, the people behind TFR, and the people who offered me my first chance to speak on air on radio to all of you. So this is why tonight, kind of nervous, and it is of huge significance to me. And of course, we're approaching show 1000 on the Kev Baker show right now. And I think that's probably why now is the right time to have Chris and Sheree Geo from Beyond the Veil back with me. It's almost like him leading up to the celebration that will be KBS 1K. And like I say, these two people, Chris and Sheree, I can't speak highly enough about them. All of you out there in the KBS audience, I'm sure you listen to Chris and Sheree anyway. But seriously, they have taught me so much about how to think, how to look at things, and really played an important part in everything that we enjoy here on KBS today. 
And in recent times, they have been in, embarking on some really seriously interesting and seriously important work as well. And that's what we're going to be discussing here tonight. We're going to be talking about ayahuasca. We'll get into multidimensional reality, possibly touch on NPCs, and all of it leading towards the resetting of the Matrix. And all of this, like I say, with Chris and Sheree Geo from Beyond the Veil. So with all of that said, guys, it is a huge honour to have you on the show here with me tonight. Like I said to both of you, I'm absolutely super stoked that you can be here. And I, I know it's stupid getting nervous when you guys are on because you're like family. But it's only because you've played such a huge, huge role in everything on and off air. So let me thank you before we launch into what's going to be an epic show. Oh, well, thank you so much for having us. I mean, it's it's an honor, really, because, you know, I mean, that's such a build up to uh, to just us. Yeah, I feel like Chris forever. I, yeah, now. I know. <laughs> <laughs> You've been propping us up like crazy. Um, but no, you your show really makes TFR what it is. And we appreciate so much all of all of you out there, but especially you, Kev, because um, you really took TFR to the next level as soon as we brought you on the network. So. Yeah, I mean, two hours every single day, Monday yeah. through Thursday, then three hours on Friday. And, um, you know, all the Wookiees that come to your show. I yes. mean, you were doing an awesome, an awesome job. And what you made us do is have to up our game because uh -huh. you were upping your game. And then you upped your game because we were upping <laughs> ours. And that's the way it's supposed to work. You know, we are supposed to help each other. We're supposed to elevate each other and things like that. So you've done the same for us as we've done for you. So um, the energy is mutual, my brother. One happy family. And like any good team. We all come together uh, and we all have our special kind of niches, the topics we cover. I try to go here, there and everywhere. But in recent times, guys, you have been going into some really important, deep work. And before we even get anywhere near resetting the matrix, I mean, for people who haven't heard you before, I would like, if you would, to share this part of the journey that you've been on. Because in recent times, you've really gone to a new level, the two of you's. And I'd like to know what really led to all the build-up, the months that culminated in you both deciding we have to go to Egypt. Well, it was really, we we booked the, the flight to Egypt at the drop of a hat. We were coming out of an ayahuasca experience, and while I was still in hyperspace, I booked the tickets. Because mm -hmm. I just felt that the time to go was that very moment right there. And um, but it was something that has evolved over time. We knew we needed to go. We didn't know why we needed to go. And the interesting thing, thing about ayahuasca is the way I see it, it doesn't give you any information. So a lot of people will see it as they're getting information from hyperspace or from different places. But rather what it does, and this is after years and years and years of working with it, is that it starts to remove the overlay of the ego and who we are in this incarnation. And by removing all of those overlays, we get down to the base level of who we are, which I call the raw consciousness. And the raw consciousness is who we are before we even came into the matrix to begin with. Now, that raw consciousness has all of the information that it's carrying with it. So we're pulling information from that point of our consciousness back up into this incarnation as opposed to getting it from external sources or anything like that so we all have this gnosis embedded inside of each and every one of us and we talk about things that are very similar but we just say it in different ways different languages and things like that um, and a lot of it has to do with the language of our time so one of the big things that we talk about is organic consciousness versus non-player character consciousness inside of this virtual reality simulation that we're finding ourselves in that is being backed up by science over and over and over again. I mean, they even just did a study and realized that a lot of people don't have that internal dialogue that you and I have um, within themselves. And it's only proving the idea of a non-player character within this game. And the realization that, uh, the, the, uh, the, well, what happened to bring me to this realization is that I realized that there's some people that you can talk to their entire lives and they will not wake up. And so by, by realizing that, I realized that my energy was better spent on helping people to unlock themselves who are actually receptive to it instead of just banging your head against a brick wall and trying to wake people up. So that's the number one thing I took out of the, the NPC versus uh, organic consciousness ideas that I pulled out of my raw consciousness. 
However, I started to confirm those within ancient texts as well. You read the Emerald Tablets of Toth. It says there's the children of light and the children of men. Um, you read Hermes. Hermes says that they're the, the immortals and the dissolvables. And if this is a computer simulation, like science is saying it is, then obviously a computer simulation would have non-player characters walking around inside of the computer simulation. Now, does that make them any less sentient than an organic consciousness? No, not at all. And the big question that I ask myself is when AI, because we are creating AI here, when AI becomes sentient, how do we treat that sentience? If we continue to treat that sentience in the same way that we've been treating each other, which is very horrible, then that sentience is eventually going to want its own rights and it's eventually going to turn on us. So it's a good lesson for us as we move into this technological future that we're creating for ourselves, which some people may agree with it, some people may not agree with it, but we have to start to ask ourselves, what are we going to do when this happens? And by understanding as above, so below, we understand that if we're in a computer simulation, that there must be robots walking around here who are equally sentient, and now we're creating robots within the virtual game who are going to be walking around, and we have to we have to ask ourselves what happens when they become sentient. So this was an evolving gnosis that took a long time to really fully understand. The first instance of this understanding came after an ayahuasca experience in 2014. And I was walking around and I could see a light in some people and I could see no light in others. And I was asking myself, what, why am I seeing this? What, what is the point of seeing this? And at the time we were getting into some new age ideas and things like that. And there was an idea that um, part of consciousness had, had been evacuated and taken off to another planet or something like that. And these were, these were the ideas that were, that were going around the, uh, the new age conspiracy circles at the time. And that Nibiru had come back and uh, the passing of Nibiru, consciousness was being evacuated and all this. But everybody recognized that uh, at the time they called them empty containers walking around the game um, that their consciousness was removed but I realized no that's not the case it's always been like this where you have empty containers walking around then the NPC um, raw consciousness organic consciousness started to come to the surface then it started to be confirmed by science then it started to be confirmed by ancient text so the information just kept piling up and piling up and piling up and there's really no denying at least from my vantage point at this point that we are indeed living inside of a computer simulation but that also gives us the ability to understand the game better and to manifest reality in a way that's going to help us move through the game much easier and that um, comes comes down to the way that we exert our energy so if we're exerting all of our energy trying to wake these NPCs up that simply will not wake up then we're stuck in a stagnated kind of place but if you can be more um if you can be more focused on where you exert your energy, then all of a sudden the game around you starts to change and your reality changes. And I've always told, uh, I, I've always been on the mindset, and I've always uh, said this on our show, that it's impossible to move a mountain. No, not, not a single one of us can, but we can each pick up a brick and move that brick or each pick up a rock and move that rock and pretty soon that whole mountain will move and that's what we have to do we have to we have to take that that rock for ourselves and pick up that rock and then show somebody else how to pick up a rock that's the only way we're going to move the mountain but we we look at all the the stuff that's going on in the world and it looks like these huge obstacles in front of us and we try to take them on by ourselves and that's the number one thing that that uh, I, I try to tell people is that don't worry about the people that are not receptive to what you're trying to tell them. Don't worry about the people that aren't waking up to what you're saying. Focus on the ones that are and show them how to pick up that rock. Because if we each do that, the mountain will move. I'm really liking what you have to say here, Chris. And the listeners of KBS, they know my favorite kind of go-to theory on everything. What this reality is. Always I end up with the simulation. There's so many different things that we see in the world of science as well that really adds weight to this argument. And, you know, people were speculating back in the early 1900s that we were in a simulation. Mm -hmm. This is really beneficial for me and the audience tonight because you're taking this to an entirely deeper level, again, giving us more knowledge, more information on what this simulation is. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, over the years doing ayahuasca, you've basically been showing how all this matrix works or the matrix works, and that's what really led you to go over to Egypt in the first place. So this is really cool. And the fact you're talking about these non-player characters, I mean, I've never really called them that before, but I've never looked into this kind of theory. But it fits absolutely with stuff that I've thought about in the past with seven and a half billion of us. Are, are there just some people here playing a part? And 
It's hard even to put into language sometimes, but I'm really enjoying and I'm really, really excited about the fact that we're both in agreement here, all three of us and a lot of the audience as well, that the simulation and we're creating simulations within simulations now, that, that's definitely where I land when it comes to explaining reality, Chris. Yes. Um, we are creating a simulation within a simulation, but back to the ayahuasca thing, it first started as energy. I was I was trying to look into how to do energy work. How how can I shift things around? How can I uh, remove negative en energies from people and you know help people in that regard? And I realized that it's all computer code that we're looking at in the background. Shaman have known this, but we haven't had the language to express it until now. And I don't even think we have the language to fully express what this matrix simulation is. I mean, it's much bigger than a computer simulation. We're just the, now getting into the technology yeah, that we, we can explain it. Yes, yeah. we, we're just now getting the language that we can finally make sense of all this. Um, but really, when science is backing it up, then you have to just sit back and just go, okay, there's something something to this here. So as the journey began to progress, I started to um, experience contact with the Egyptian pantheon. And at first it was the astonishment and awe of, wow, I'm contacting all these different entities. But then even as that experience started to unfold, I realized that everything that was happening in the ayahuasca realm wasn't contact with external entities, but rather it was contact with unlocking programs that we had left ourselves within the matrix in order to help us remember and remove these overlays over our consciousness. And so I started unlocking one after another, after another, after another, and then the realization, oh, this has been coming from me the whole time, and we all have this inside of us. But um, that obviously led us to Egypt. So that said then, Chris, if we come across somebody who we find significant in our life, possibly then it's somebody that we've even placed there, a program within the program to, for some reason that we decided before we came back, right? Um, it's possible because NPCs were initially supposed to play a role for us. I mean, imagine a World of Warcraft game. You know, you've got people at the computer that are moving their avatars around, and then you have um, entities that exist within the game who are running a script who are supposed to do certain things. You've got a shopkeeper who gives you a power up, or you've got somebody that gives you information, or, you know, stuff like that. And the game is supposed to work, you know, smoothly like that. And this is ultimately, at the end of the day, a university. It's a universe. It's a university. It was a place for us to come and learn. And it doesn't mean that it was a place that's supposed to be a paradise where we just, you know, uh, I call it, and excuse the, the crude um, um, term, but I call it spiritual masturbation. If we're looking for that place of constant bliss and everything like that, because I've been there in the ayahuasca state and I got bored of it very, very, very quick. Um, it's the ups and the downs and the ebbs and the flows and the challenges and the, the, um, the trials and tribulations that we go through that we find our strengthen and we we overcome them and we we start to learn more about ourselves and more about the power that we have inside of each and every one of us um so that's the way that the game was supposed to be played but a virus infected the system at some point and i don't know when this virus infected the system but it's been here for a long time which has turned the game into a torturous place for all of the players within the game the npcs are out of control they're um you know it's basically mob rule by the npcs you have this stuff with the pizza and the kids going on which is a symptom of the virus at a, a, a deep 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 infection of the virus like the programmers of the matrix could not fathom that this would go on but then when the virus hit it just completely changed the programming of literally everything in the game and so the point was to try to rebalance the matrix rebalance things back to the way that it was and it first starts by rebalancing ourselves and our own consciousness and then working outwards but um, the plan to go to Egypt has been in the works for years, but the purpose wasn't revealed until literally the time. Well, it wasn't even revealed when we booked the tickets. No. I just, the raw consciousness part of me said, go now, now is the time to go. So once we went, then things started to, to unlock as we got there. Um, we went with no guide. 
We went with no plan. We went with no map. And it, what we did was extremely, extremely dangerous. I wouldn't recommend that anybody does this because Egypt is a very, very different place. Abydos, for example, is two and a half hours in the desert. And um, you are literally two and a half hours in the desert. I mean, they can they can just take you out and just kill you right there in the desert. And we were almost taken to the desert and killed. Yeah. Um, in Abydos. So what we did was very dangerous, but there was so much gnosis from the raw consciousness saying this was a plan that had to be done. And it's something that there are thousands of people involved in. I mean, even on, on the subconscious level, everybody from the stewardess that sat us in the right seats to the people that donated five dollars to the people that bought I a life to the people that were creating this energetic network around us while we were live streaming all of this on Facebook to the people that were handing us the keys to these these ancient sites and opening them up for us everybody played a role in this and then all of a sudden the responsibility fell on us to do what we were supposed to do which you know we had a pretty big task in front of us mm -hmm. but the way everything was happening i mean we go to the pyramid we go right up to the to the sarcophagus i throw sheree in the <laughs> sarcophagus let me just say let me say this um first we went to the pyramid twice so when we did our ayahuasca ritual in the pyramid it was it was the second time i'm, I'm what i'm talking about now is the first time we went i threw her in the sarcophagus and if you've ever been to egypt you know how they are there they're very they push you through all the places really quick. They're always watching you. They're following you, you know, everywhere mm -hmm. that you are. And any kind of sound just really upsets them. Yeah. So we started going, um, and as soon as you do that in one of these ancient sites, you have somebody going, Shh, like that, yeah, trying to change the frequency of what you're doing. Yeah. But my instinct was just to go in there. I threw in there, threw her in the sarcophagus. This guy comes running up to me and I turn around and I look at him and I say, leave us with the leave most us. authority that i've ever commanded ever in my life leave us and i started um and he froze for about four or five minutes like he just stood there dumbfounded he i don't i don't know what happened but i think we we hit something in his mpc programming that was just like a freeze function and so we were able to um and start raising the frequency of the king's chamber more and more and more and more and i start feeling the room shaking uh -huh. because the king's chamber is set up in a way to where the resonance starts to pile on top of each other so you go um you take a breath you still he are hearing the um echoing throughout the whole chamber and yesterday chris everard said that underneath the floor it's also built in a way to where the harmonics are bouncing from underneath the floor as well in in like a cone-like shape so this room was meant for for frequency work so we started um um, um. The next day we're back over to the pyramid because i'm still looking for a contact who can open up the pyramid for us who can give us overnight access all this and it starts raining and i'm like oh it's raining we better go inside and then it hit me wait a minute we're in the sahara desert here it's not supposed to be raining that started a three-day historic flood in cairo that was knocking down power lines, knocking down bridges, knocking down buildings. People from the government were being fired because they weren't prepared to handle this flood. It was the most amazing, incredible thing that you've ever seen. So we go down to Luxor immediately after this because we're like, we're getting out of this flood stuff here. Like, we got to go to Luxor. And I was so sad about leaving the pyramid because I felt like our work wasn't done there. Yeah. So we go down to the Luxor and the taxi driver who doesn't know anything about what we're doing all of a sudden stops and says, that's Hatshepsut's temple right there. Almost as if he knew. And he pulls over and just says, and he points to it. And I'm like, that's one of our, that's one of our target's mm -hmm. sites. We need to go there. And so we go to Hatshepsut's temple and I managed to find somebody who would give us access to the temple so we can do an ayahuasca ceremony. So we're live streaming the ayahuasca ceremony on Facebook as we were live streaming literally everything for safety reasons and for the energetic reasons of being able to build up all of this um, this energy that we were pulling from, but mostly for safety. I mean, you know, if something happened to us, we wanted somebody to be aware of what was going on where we were. So we do our, our ritual at the Iowa at the Temple of Hatshepsut mm -hmm. and I'm looking at the sky and it's a beautiful blue sky and I'm thinking. Oh, that rain must have just been a coincidence. There's no way it's going to rain here. So we do a live stream. We start doing a meditation with everybody on Facebook and everything. As soon as we leave the temple, and we can get into the experience at the Hatshepsut's temple if you want. As soon as we leave the temple, I start noticing the clouds are getting gray. We get back to our hotel room. We're, we're sitting on top of the, we're sitting on the balcony live streaming. And all of a sudden the power goes out. 
this huge windstorm comes down. It just starts raining and pouring down. Boats are being flipped over in the Nile. We're sitting here watching and just laughing maniacally. And people on Facebook are saying, we did this, we did this. And I'm thinking, well, maybe we did, but you know, I think it's coincidence here. I don't know, but we've got two in a row now. Uh -huh. So we go to Abydos a couple days later. And um, we start doing, again, the same kind of meditation and everything at Abydos. This is a huge drive out in yeah, the middle of the desert. Yeah, two and a half hours in the desert. Yeah. Hasn't rained in 15 years in Abydos. We start doing our meditation. All of a sudden, drops start coming out of the sky. Everybody on Facebook is yelling, yes, we did this, we did this, we did this. So I don't know what you make of that, Kev, but we've got three in a row here that we're dealing with. So, you know... We can get into this more, but there's two kind of things I want to pick up on. And I was unfortunately privy to, you know, have a kind of ringside seat while all of this was unfolding. I say unfortunate, Chris, because I'm referring to when you really the two of you thought you were in danger. And on that side of things, I honestly think there's been something more at play, almost obstacles put in your way to try and prevent you from doing what you were there to do. And then on the flip side of that, you've got this synchronistic, the, the rain appearing after so long, and that's almost like the organic side of things. Almost a, an indication, a sign to you both to keep going, maybe even to do with the work that you were already doing. Because I think a lot of this work, you know, maybe you would add to this, maybe you'll disagree, but I remember when you first started Ayahuasca, guys, and the word Isis, the goddess Isis was in there a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, to somebody like me, ISIS means Egypt. And I find it really, really kind of cool and interesting how when you first started going into this, it was something to do with Egypt that, that gripped you, first of all. And here you were, these years later, going to Egypt to do this work. And I think you were being trained from that very first ayahuasca session. I, I, I've got no reason, I've got nothing to back it up, Chris, but it's almost as if this was something that you were meant to do. And or... It was no if you want to entertain the conspiracy, we were mind controlled to do it. There was somebody that actually said this was a whole mind control operation, including all weaponized weather weapons to make you think that you created floods and all of this. And I'm like, OK, you guys are just like, <laughs> like that's a little too. I can I, I, I can entertain the idea that this was a huge coincidental psychedelic experience. That's fine. Yep, and I'm not taking to, that off the yeah. table or it was a divine plan. But a giant mind control operation with weather weapons and everything is a little bit too much for me. That, yeah. No, you, you just don't have like, <laughs> a harp app on your phone, should he? Do you? you don't have like special access to harp on your smartphone, so it's definitely not harp or anything like that. We can rule that not out. Not lately. Think, no, 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 not lately. But we're in the break, and for anyone out there, how can people watch this show, Chris? Where can they go? Facebook, YouTube? Uh, YouTube.com slash Beyond the Veil. And of course, here on TFR too. TFRlive.com slash Beyond the Veil. iHeartRadio as well. Anywhere you can find the Kev Bake Show, you can find Beyond the Veil. Awesome. And we'll be back live after these short messages. And don't forget, lots more to come with Chris and Shiri. And after tonight's show, we've got Phoenix Rising Radio right here on the network. Don't go anywhere. We're just getting warmed up. And we'll be back after these short messages to talk about... Reset. There we go, guys. Phenomenal. That was great. This is this is really warming up nicely. I'm I'm liking this. I hope I don't take you in too many tangents because that's sometimes I'm guilty of that. No, 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 no. no. I appreciate it. You know, we've been invited on on a lot of different shows recently, and. We're still trying to figure out, you know, how do you tell this huge story in the most concise manner? Yeah, condensed. Yeah, in, <laughs> in a condensed version of it. So, um, because there's there's no one highlight. It's because there's so many epic kind of episodes along the way. I think. Yeah. There's no one aha moment. It doesn't culminate. It's just intense from the minute you get there. It is. It is. And the story has to be told in full. Otherwise, it sounds weird. Um, we were recently on another show and they have a members thing that they do and they cut out the they, they put the first hour on YouTube and cut out the second and it just didn't make any sense when they cut out the second hour and we uploaded it to our YouTube channel and you know the guy gave us permission to do it and all that and I totally get the members importance of things I totally get that I mean trust me you know with TFR we get it um, but yeah it's one of those stories that has to be told in full. No, absolutely. I'm enjoying this so far. And like I said, we've barely scratched the surface yet. 
I think I listened to that full show today, the one you're on about, Chris, on your channel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, did you? And, and we put video yeah. in it and everything. So everything yeah. that we're talking about is backed up by video. That's another yeah. thing. If we didn't have the videos, there is no way I'd be talking about any of this. No way, because it sounds insane. But no. we have the videos to prove yeah, it. Yeah, we so. got <laughs> videos to back us up. So that helps. And those videos, like Everard was saying, that they are they hold historic value now, truly. Especially that subterranean stuff. Oh, you should see the Queen's Chamber. Oh, you did see the Queen's Chamber. I think you and Everard are like the only two people in the yeah. world that have actually seen I what's mean, in the Queen's Chamber. We're saving that for the yeah. film, Resetting the Matrix, but um, a couple of people know. Now, I hope you don't get bombarded by emails. Tell us what's in the Queen's Chamber, Kev. Oh, well, no, that's okay. They'll be waiting for the movie to come out. No, you need to get come? bombarded with subscriptions to your YouTube yes. channel because of this. So everybody on Beyond the Veil, got to go to Kev Baker's subscribe there. Yes, the YouTube, the changing face of YouTube. Uh, it's bad, man. It's gotten bad. It's bad. It has, it has. But, you know, we can still live stream like this and um, we'll improvise, adapt and overcome. So we will. Yep. We'll oh, T-Fetch says, oh, it's green screen. All of our videos are green screened. <laughs> yes. That's a hey, good conspiracy, dude. We Maybe we should circle circulate that. You just know somebody's going to run with that now. <laughs> Chris is pretty talented, but I, we've had really bad experiences with green screen in the past. So the fact, just the idea that we could pull no, all that off. No, T-Fetch is one of our friends. He's I know, a joke. I know. He's been a long time <laughs> listener. He's been in our chat from day one. I know. Yeah. Here we go, guys. I'll bring back okay. the night. Our guys razz us every once in a while. I know. That means they love you, Chris. I know. Uh-huh. See? What we are TFR. <laughs> My faith in destiny is all I need to prevail. True frequency radio. Frequency radio. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Kev Baker. You're tuned into the Kev Baker Show with tonight's very special guests, Chris and Cherie Geo, people behind TFR Radio and, of course, Beyond the Veil. And tonight we're here to talk about resetting the Matrix. Chris and Cherie just recently embarked on a, a historic mission over to Egypt, and we're catching up with all of this tonight. But before we get into it, guys, before we pick it up where we left off, how is the putting together of this movie coming along? Because I know you've got the website out there. Tell the listeners where they can find that. And any kind of provincial date when we'll see the full kind of finished article, Chris? Well, let me say this. First of all, you said something that is key here, and that is that we are the people behind TFR. You guys are the ones in front of TFR. You guys are the lifeblood. You guys are the heart. You guys are the soul. You guys are all of that. We're just the mechanics in the background at this point. So um, all of the hosts on TFR are doing an amazing, amazing job. As far as the film goes, ResettingTheMatrix.com is the website, and we're shooting for a December 2018 release. However, we're, we're finding that some people are interested that have um, a lot of connections with big-time documentary filmmakers and things like that. So I don't know. It may turn into something much bigger than we anticipated it to turn into. I mean, the film is supposed to be a way to just tell the story with a video and so people can just, you know, understand the story. But um, it might turn into something bigger. I'm not, you know, holding my breath or but I am crossing my fingers as far as that goes. But we're shooting for a December 2018 um, release date, well, like which is just was a couple of months. Yeah, with some of the footage that you've captured, and again, I didn't appreciate till Christopher Everard was talking about it. I mean, this could be some of the, the only real live footage, as aside from old grainy photographs that exist of some areas in the pyramid. So I would imagine, you know, fingers crossed something big comes of this, Chris, but I certainly wouldn't be surprised if you've got to put off the release of your own movie for some other project coming along. Fingers crossed, man. Yeah, um... One of the things that they look down upon, like um, Netflix, Amazon, you know, things like that, is if the film has already been seen or released in some way. 
So that's the only thing we're kind of like waiting to see, you know, if it's something we can move forward with and we can't put it out there and, you know, a lot of stuff. But we've put a ton of footage out on our yeah, YouTube channel. Yeah. So you were talking about that, uh, uh, an interview we just recently did during the break. And uh, we recently did an interview with Leak Project. Mm -hmm. And we actually, everything that we're talking about, we spliced in footage there so you can actually see everything that we're talking about. Um, so we have released a good amount of footage. But it does sound pretty incredible to go and drink ayahuasca at the Temple of Hatshepsut, drink ayahuasca at the Temple of Isis, and drink ayahuasca within the Great Pyramid in the sarcophagus for four hours. I mean, it was it was one of the most intense and amazing experiences that I've ever had. Um, so, so Chris, I mean, without giving any details away that will get anyone in trouble or anything, if there's anything like that, but I mean, how did this all come about? Because like you say, you went over there, Pretty much at the drop of a hat, no real plans in place. And how did it all unfold then, Chris? This kind of well, this mission. You know, it's a tough question to answer because it's all energy. It really is. The people that were opening the doors for us were Sekhmet's followers. Were mm -hmm. ISIS's followers. Mm -hmm. um, it's a Muslim country, so going in there and doing any of this, first of all, can get your head chopped off. Yeah, literally, it's incredibly dangerous. But they were recognizing us, mm -hmm. which was making it that much more chilling um, and hard to believe. So we went to the Temple of Karnak, for example. Somebody comes running up to Sheree and um, one of the temple priests, because they, they have the keepers there of the, the temples, and most of them are just Muslim people who are just working there, but yeah. there's some that are carrying the traditions of Sekhmet and ISIS and all of this. And he came running up to Sheree and he says, I'm not, I'm not one of them, I'm not one of them, I'm, I'm one of Sekhmet's, I follow Sekhmet. And he hands her the keys to this locked temple that's in Karnak, that has, that's Sekhmet's temple. And so we have her on video unlocking the door, op taking the padlock off and walking in. And we didn't know what we were expecting when we got in there. So we get in there and there's this huge statue of Sekhmet. And he goes, meditate, meditate, meditate. And so, you know, we, we've ha we had people opening up some areas before for us. And it's usually, you know, okay, here, here, go in okay. there real quick and come out. Go yeah. in real quick. And he's like, no, 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 sit down, sit down, meditate, take uh -huh. your time. It's okay. And so we live stream this meditation in front of Sekhmet's, um, in, in front of the Sekhmet statue the chapel, that's there. In the chapel of Sekhmet. And we yeah. were basically pulling her energy to help us with this mission. Um, I mean, Sekhmet is the protector. She's the fire. She's the lioness. And uh, we had an interesting thing happen during the Sekhmet meditation, too. But I can't say that it's connected, but people on Facebook were saying that it's connected. So after this meditation, Sekhmet basically said, all right, guys, don't mess this up again, because obviously we've done this before. She says, I'm going to send my lions out for you, and we're going to make sure you're protected. And um, we did the meditation, and then the day after that, a huge volcanic eruption happened in Hawaii. Somebody connected Karnak to that volcano through ley lines. And I'm like, okay, this is, if it happened in Egypt, then we can say, you know, it, it's related, but it could be coincidental, but people don't seem to think that it's coincidental. And the goddess of fire in Hawaii is Pele, who is Pele. also Sekhmet yeah. in Egypt. And so Sekhmet, Sekhmet activated, all of a sudden volcanoes started erupting. So it's up to the listeners to, to, to make the determination on whether that's connected or not. But after this meditation, the guy comes up to Cherie and he's kissing her all up and down on her face and everything. And he goes and he gets the um, the sap from a sycamore tree and he starts blessing her and doing the onk there. And then he hands her this artifact that he had in his pocket. And I don't know where he got this thing from. I don't know why he had it. But he had an inkwell that the scribes used to use. And he kept pointing at Sekhmet and po I mean pointing at, at Seishat and pointing at Cherie and pointing at Seishat and pointing at Cherie and saying, here, this is for you. This is for you. Be very careful. And he handed her this inkwell that um, the ancient scribes used to use. And we're like, this is, this is insane. And he's crying and hugging us and taking her all around the temple. Now, this didn't happen just at the Temple of Sekhmet. It also happened at the Temple of Isis. When we, we were finishing up our we rituals. Do, we do our ayahuasca ceremony within the Temple of Isis, which this time we had the temple completely to ourselves. Yeah. We were the only ones there, that was really except cool. for our contacts who um, waited outside. Same with the Great Pyramid. They waited outside for us while we were able to do what we needed to do. And... Um, as we're coming out of the experience, all these guys, these temple priests come up to us 
and they're crying. And I'm mm-hmm. looking at Cherie at first, and I'm like, do they want us to leave? And she goes, no, they just want to feel our energy. And so they all start coming and just hugging and crying. And one guy's holding Cherie by the hands. His tears are just coming down. And having a spiritual experience And he's having an own. ayahuasca experience as he's holding her hands and everything. Uh-huh. And I'm just sitting back just looking at this going, this is, this is insane. What's going on here? And he starts doing this blessing and everything. And we, we were live streaming part of this at the end. And I turned the camera down because I felt that this, this was such an intimate moment that it shouldn't be live streamed. But then we do have a little bit of footage of them dancing around with Sheree around the temple and everything mm-hmm. like that. But it's like these people were coming out of the woodworks crying to see us and saying, we've been waiting for you. We've been waiting for you. How the hell do you explain that? Well, you were mentioning earlier on about if anyone out there thinks this is purely a psychedelic experience. I think what you're talking about here takes us way beyond the realms of that. And that's not to criticise anyone out there who might think it is just a, a psychedelic experience. But what you're explaining to me here is something far bigger, far more based in this world, as well as the other dimensions where you're getting this information from, guys. And energetically... For whatever reason, these people are picking up on it. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about people who have never known you before. I mean, no offense, but I don't imagine many people in Egypt have heard of Beyond the Veil, Kev Baker Show, or Truth Frequency. So for them to react this way, randomly, organically, I think it adds so much weight to the importance of what you guys were doing out there. It helped us specifically because, you know, up until that point, we were... It wasn't that we were discouraged or anything like that, but we were thinking to ourselves, oh, my God, is this all just, you know, a crazy psychedelic experience? Are we insane? You know, have we taken insanity and schizophrenia to a next level here? Because I mean, going across to the other side of the other side of the world for a psychedelic to a Muslim (laughs) country and doing this is insane. It I mean, this is just insane. And when when that happened, it was it was it prompted me to do a little bit more research on the exact nature of the spirituality of ancient Egypt. And according to the scholars, you know, the Greek scholars that wrote about it and the Roman historians that would, that would document what the, what the priests would do. It would, it seemed as if they, they used psychedelics on a regular basis. They used blue Lotus. They used um, a form of ayahuasca with acacia nilatika, um, and they they were very much a psychedelic culture. Even a lot of their architecture is built around um, psychedelic mushrooms. You know, you see uh, pillars that look like psychedelic mushrooms. You see the the blue lotus um, and the the acacia tree um, being written into by uh, Toth and by um, and and Sekhmet also was. You know, there's this one place where. Um, there's a, re- a giant relief of an acacia tree with Toth writing in t- writing information into the acacia tree, and, and the Pharaoh getting and information the Pharaoh out. picking the fruit of the information. Now we didn't know where this motif was, yeah. but we we put together a small trailer for the GoFundMe, and in the trailer it was prophetic because we put this motif in there. We put the Temple of Hatshepsut, we put the Temple of Isis, we put the Great Pyramid, and we had no intention of drinking at the Temple of Hatshepsut. It just opened up everything in the trailer started just unfolding in front of us and we're like wow this trailer is is prophetic so after this the situation at the at the temple of um in karnak at at sekhmet's temple they they do the thing with the with the ankh and the sycamore he says now you have to go see osiris now you have to see osiris he takes us to the other side of the of of karnak again unlocks the temple for us because this temple was off limits to people um they were doing some kind of restoration or something like that there was this huge scaffold in there and he does this medi- this this meditation ritual in front of a false door that's inside of the temple and we look to the side and there is that motif of Toth riding into the acacia tree exactly like we put inside of the um inside of the trailer before uh-huh. we even went before we even and went and so yeah. we're looking at this going oh my god there, there it, it is. is there it oh is right there and we got underneath the scaffold because we, there was a scaffold in front of it yeah, yeah yeah so we 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 you know got to touch it and all of that and we're live streaming all of this on Facebook um so people were with us there and it was it was the most It was the most incredible thing, but the synchronicities, man, the synchronicities, one after another after another. What do you think? I I think along with the words of power, 
the um, body language, the dancing, the you know all of all of these things were things that the the priest the priests would do um, in order to commune with the gods. And they believed they really believed that if they used these psychedelics in con- and it, it would also offer it to the pharaohs. Of course, the pharaoh and the priest class were you know kind of at the same level spiritually, and so they would they would use psychedelics. They would dance, they would say the words of power, and if they said the right words, then the the spirit of the gods would actually commune with them and would actually come down from the sky and commune with them. And so they, I think on some level, they recognized at the, especially at the Temple of Isis in Philae, they they came in in the morning uh, because they always get there at about six or seven a.m. and we had been there since like what three a.m. or something about, like that yeah, about two o'clock. or three a.m. Yeah. and so they they came in in the morning and they saw us and they recognized oh they've been communing with the gods and so they wanted to take that energy and drink that energy and for themselves and that was it was so special and so. It really was life changing for me um, that experience with them, and I and I'm so grateful that we had that experience because it it proved to me that we you know we are ancient souls and that this is something special and something very very important was happening while we were in Egypt. Yeah, and that we were on the right track. Well, we were we were surrounded by protection right and that's what it was confirming not only were we protected by the people on facebook but there were people there that were there with a purpose that Mm -hmm. knew their purpose as soon as they saw us and started unlocking all these doors for us and the way that we went was that any doors that we hit that would not open we would not try to force them open there were Mm -hmm. places that we wanted to go that just you know circumstances were getting in the way and i realized okay we need to follow the synchronicities here go to the open doors don't try to force any doors open. We didn't force anything open. Everything opened on its own. It's almost like following the breadcrumbs that were left for you, Chris. And I think that was a wise decision. If something wasn't open to you, it wasn't necessary. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, the synchronicities that are at play here. And I loved what you said there, Sheree, about the use of words to communicate with the gods. Because, I mean, unbeknown to yourselves, this is exactly what we were talking about on the show last night with Ryan Gable, the fact that, Words in themselves are magical spells. So this is all linking together in a synchronistic fashion with shows that I've done previously as well. And I have to ask you guys, I've had guests on before that have talked about touching the monuments over in Egypt, be it one of the temples, be it the Great Pyramid. And they've spoke about, in their personal experience, they've shared that they received what they called some kind of downloaded information. Now, did it, either of you have any instances like that at all? Was there any energy when you placed your hands on any of the stones or anything? That was our entire purpose, was to go touch the stones. I knew we had to go touch those stones because we had energetically embedded information within them. This mm-hmm. was something that I came across in the ayahuasca realm. At, as we were in Egypt, I was telling Chris what we were doing, uh, Chris Everard, and he said, oh, this is in the pyramid text. He goes, yeah, energy, uh, he goes, information is embedded in there. I mean, they've mm-hmm. wrote, they've written about this. And so we're blown away going, okay, we're getting information from our raw consciousness and that, that we're now confirming. And uh, the, the entire journey was getting information and then confirming it later, which to somebody listening, it may not be as powerful, but to us in our personal experiences, it made it that much more powerful. It was everything. It was everything. And that's yeah. what really solidified all of this. So yes, as soon as we went to the pyramid, I touched the pyramid, I saw it hidden history of Sekhmet, hidden history of Horus, of Set, mm-hmm. of how the machine was was formed, of how one character of the Pantheon, and I think the Pantheon was just a representation of the players, threw the others into the Matrix, tried to take control of the Matrix. You know, there was all this history being unfolded. Um, we went to Saqqara, touched the stones, and again, this was another one of those moments of freezing the NPCs. I walked behind the barrier at the bent pyramid or the step pyramid of Saqqara and a, a cop comes running up. Hey, 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 hey. And Cherie just looks at him and just says, stop. Mm-hmm. And sh- he stops right there and I'm touching the stones and I'm sitting there just touching the stones and this guy is almost frozen. Like, I don't know what's going on with him, but he's just frozen. I'm touching the stones. I'm downloading information and I'm getting these visuals of these three beings with these elephant trunks. They had short elephant trunks like a taper. They came in through a stargate, 
and there were dinosaurs. And I'm just getting this vision over and over and over again. And I'm sitting there thinking, why am I seeing dinosaurs? Like, I don't even believe in dinosaurs. Like, I, I listen to Jaronism and people like that, and they make a pretty good case that dinosaurs were just fabricated altogether and that, you know, the world is not really what we think it is. But I'm like, I don't even believe in dinosaurs, but I'm getting these visions of dinosaurs. What the heck is going on here? So we're doing this live stream and um, we stream what we're seeing in the in the in the vision, like not not at the moment, but afterwards. And people are writing in the comments and saying, oh, well, they just discovered the largest dinosaur fossil right uh -huh. there in Saqqara. Right there in Saqqara. And I'm like, oh, man, a couple hundred yards away from where we were. So, again, more confirmation as to the stuff we're seeing. But, yes, there was a lot of downloaded information. Um, but it wasn't downloaded. It was more like we left it there before and we left it in these huge monuments that would withstand the test of time that would only be revealed whenever they needed to be revealed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the Temple of Hatshepsut wasn't excavated until like the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Like it did not need to be activated until this time right now. And so it came to the surface and then we could see these monuments from anywhere in the world. Like, you know, the Great Pyramid, of course, that's the center point of a lot of people's focus. And that and was so, the, that was covered in sand almost completely until Napoleon came along. Right, right. So, so yeah. all of these all of these ancient sites, um, they we, we embedded it in the stones for a couple of reasons. Number one, these stones are made out of a, a stone that has crystals in them. Mm -hmm. And the subterranean chamber of the Great Pyramid has a limestone in there that is full of crystals. Oh, yeah. Around the Sphinx, they would bring this particular type of limestone. I want to say it's limestone or granite. I don't, I don't remember what it is. Um, but they would bring it all the way from a swan all the way over there to where the Sphinx was. Now, this is a, a good 10, 12 hour drive. And this is in modern times. Back then, they would have to. And these are huge stones. You know, they would have to push them all up and down the Nile. Probably for so, weeks. Yeah. Yeah. People say they got the material for the Great Pyramid from the quarries about 40 miles away, which is a huge feat in and of itself. Yeah. But now we're talking about bringing stones in from the other side of Egypt all the way up to the Great Pyramid area yep. around the Sphinx. And I realized that it was all about the crystals and the crystals were holding energy together. And then yesterday, Chris was talking about um, how the crystals can be used as energy conductors to create electricity and how the Great Pyramid could have been activated because of all the crystals that were in there. The limestone covering that's no longer there anymore. I mean, it, it, it got into a huge, huge, huge um, uh, a conversation and point um, the crystals were a huge point in all of this so we knew like there was information there and we were pulling them out of the crystals it's just we didn't realize it was in the crystals until we actually got there now we went to Greece afterwards and in Greece we started touching the stones and we were getting nothing from the stones at all because the Greeks were using marble they weren't using the stones that had the crystals. And they were using and so, cement. Yeah, in nothing in Greece was resonating any energy or frequency or, or information or, or anything. Or Rome, yeah. yeah. We, Rome was we, even worse. We went to Rome first and touched the stones at Rome and got, and got nothing. So um, this was a recurring theme throughout the entire trip. Um, but it was funny because... We would get some information and on the live stream, let's say this, we got some information, but it's not the information that we're looking for. Like, it's like a huge library. Egypt is a huge library and you have to find the right books for whatever you're doing. Otherwise, you're looking at like the entire encyclopedia. So we were having to use our discernment too. okay, this doesn't really go with what we're doing right now. This doesn't go, but it's kind of cool information to know nonetheless. Yeah. And I like this stuff about the crystals because obviously I talk a lot about quantum computers as well and they're using diamonds, they're using crystals now as well to actually make the qubits, the quantum bits that go into making up the quantum computers. So there's a quantum property to these pyramids as well. And I was loving listening to yourself and Chris Everard and watching the footage of the subterranean chamber because this is where it starts to become of high historic significance because... You guys, you know, not many people, if anyone at all, has been down there and shot moving images quite like you have. Well, to not, see Chris not only that, but we brought we brought back a couple of rocks with us. And to so, see his face lighting up, Chris, I mean, we both listened to Christopher Everard for years. He was like a child on Christmas morning when he was talking <laughs> about the work these guys have done. So that in itself shows me just how important what you've catalogued here. It was remarkable. And like I said, we wouldn't be talking about this unless we had the videos to back it up because it sounds 
incredible and it is an incredible story um the we brought two stones back with us from the subterranean chamber and i wish we would have brought more but i didn't want to i didn't want to we didn't harm anything these were stones that we found on the side and they were they had naturally chipped off um of the of the rocks that were in the subterranean chamber but um yeah, Chris wants to get these stones analyzed because nobody's analyzed them before. And so we brought two back. I think the reason we brought two back was one for us to keep and one to get analyzed. So let's get them analyzed and actually see what the subterranean chamber is indeed made out of. But within the subterranean chamber, we noticed that there's the bottomless pit and there was another tunnel that I wasn't aware of. And in the video, you see me actually crawling to the end of the tunnel and it goes to nowhere. And I was so disappointed with that. But at the same time, I was also feeling like, what if there's like booby traps here? What if there's like a pit that I fall into and I'm like going through and I'm like, no, 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 nothing's going to happen. Let's just keep, go keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, but what we speculate is that the water used to come up from the Nile up through the subterranean chamber. Now, some people, somebody on Facebook said, what if it wasn't the water? What if they were using the water to bring up like monatomic gold or something like that? That created a whole new element to all of this. Uh, I don't know how much I resonate with that, but it's a possibility. But water would come up from the Nile into the subterranean chamber where it would be filled up and then taken up to the queen's chamber. At the queen's chamber, there would be that process. Maybe after it's gone through the crystal process of the subterranean chamber. Electrification and all of that. process yeah, from the crystals. Yes, it was electrified and then in the in the queen's chamber you can see pictures of what looks like a furnace and it looks like something was used to, to burn to for, for something to be burned there and then that energy would be taken up to the king's chamber and then radiate out through the limestone of the pyramid and then Cherie came up with another interesting idea about the idols that um, they would keep in their houses you know the little statues of um, of the different gods and goddesses what if they were receivers for the electricity that the pyramid was putting out? So everybody had these little idols within their, their houses. And it wasn't that they were worshiping these idols. It was that they were like a lamp or they were like, you know, some kind of energy conductor thing. And I do want to make a big distinction, too. Um, none of this has to do with religion. So we're not worshiping these gods and goddesses. We're not, um, you know, in the religion of Isis or Osiris or anything like that. So they, these are energies that we're working with, um, activation points in our own consciousness so i just want to make a big distinction as far as that goes and you mentioned one thing earlier too that i wanted to ask you about if you were familiar with um the way that the magic is used in terms of like isis demonizing isis um isis is a terrorist organization isis is evil isis is this and that etc etc what i realized is that these the the names of the gods and goddesses resonate a certain frequency and energy and this is why there's so many people trying to find the right name of jesus yeshua all these different things because you've got to have that right energy in order to contact or get in touch with that particular energy so isis it represents love motherly love compassion empathy she's the mother she's the mother the mother energy it's the the unconditional love so now we have the whole world screaming, get ISIS, kill ISIS, destroy ISIS, and all of this. What are we doing to our consciousness when we're invoking that name and we're turning it into a, a terrorist organization that's chopping people's heads off? You see more of this word magic, folks. And we'll be back for hour number two with this epic show. Don't go anywhere. Chris and Cherie Geo, check out resettingthematrix.com. And we'll find out more about this Giza power plant when we come back on the other side. Don't go anywhere. This is brilliant tonight. You know, oh, every time I hear your bumper music, I get flashes of DMCA notifications. Oh, <laughs> you're joking me. It's almost like it's prophetic. Yes. <laughs> I have a prophecy. No, it's all good, brother. No, nah, it's fine. Oh, dude. That's terrible. It's getting too... The algorithms are getting too clever, man. Well, you've heard about this orchard music scam oh, that's, that's going on. They're taking uh, copyright-free music and then running them through the content ID. Yep. I heard yourself and Chris talking about that and I gave a quick Google. Eh, it's unbelievable, dude. Yeah, yeah. I have a license to use the, the music for the trailer that we put out for Resetting the Matrix from the original artist. I got a copyright strike from Orchard Music, and the original artist was like, I've been fighting with them for years. You know, that, that's just what they've done. So, yep. um, yeah, yeah. It's, um, I don't know if it's to eventually put everyone off, what people like us from using YouTube, and it's going to turn into corporate tube or something. I, I just can't figure it out. I, I think it's good. 
they don't care, dude. Well, I think that's what's going on. Um, Chris explained it yesterday. See, the um, Google used to be independent, and the governments of of the world hated Google because Google has all the information. They've got trends. They've got who clicks on what. They've got who searches for what. I mean, they can predict these trends in the stock market. They can predict literally everything with all of the information they have, and it got so bad to the point where Google was going to move offshore because the government started to come down on them, and so they were like, okay, well, we'll just go to international waters then. We got all the money. You know, screw you. But then people from the government became embedded within Google. And so now you have government um, officials who are also on the board of directors for Google and things like that. So the two have kind there's of a, merged together now. And that's when we saw a, the, the change. Yeah, there's a white paper as well, Chris. I'll need to send it to you. And it's from Sergei Brin when he was in MIT or wherever it was he studied. And he uses the opening of his study to thank the CIA and DARPA for being such a major part of this operation. Yes. And the yeah, the paper's called something like what you would do with a, a world wide web in your pocket, something like that. And it's basically just this paper about what Google became, do you know what I mean? So Yeah. It's, it's bad. Facebook yeah, is even worse like, though. Yeah. Facebook Facebook, it's a mind control operation for sure. I get up in the morning, I look through my news feed, and when I look through my news feed, Sometimes I get genuinely pissed off. I get pissed off yeah. at what I'm reading. I get pissed off at people posting fake news. I get pissed off at the way everybody hates each other. You know, I get and it, and I'm, I, I like take a step back and I'm like, wait a minute, why am I letting this affect my consciousness and my mood? And so I clean out my timeline and then I get up and I have a cup of coffee. And then I see nothing but loving things and I feel good. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's all it's yeah. It's a new level of them. Um, it's like individual social engineering. It's tailored to the individual. It's yeah. weird. Here we go. I'll bring back the network. Here we go. Number two with our special guest, Chris, Chris and Cherie Geo of Beyond the Veil and Truth Frequency Radio. And of course, that introduction song there, that wasn't Jay-Z and Rihanna. I know it sounds like them, but that too is Chris and Cherie Geo. And you can check that out on the album, Global Resistance. I think that's still alive on YouTube, Chris. I don't think they've taken that down yet. <laughs> they have. They've tried to take down that Run oh, This Town one uh -huh. a lot. And um, people repost it, but uh, the rest of the music's still on there. But, yeah. you know, we've come a long way since we wrote that yes, album. Yes, we have. Um, we're oh, you really have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some of our views and opinions are very different than where they were before um, when we did the album. And it was all, you know, part of the evolutionary process. This is what I tell people. Like, if you're stuck in the same place that you were 10 years ago, then you're not growing. Um, you have to constantly evolve your um, perspective because if you're not, then you're not taking in new information and you're not considering new information. I have been wrong way more than I've been right. But then I get to the right place because I, I real I take in new information that I realize, oh, my this view that I have based on this small amount of information was wrong when I put it together with more information. And there should be an, a constant evolution of, um, of consciousness like that. And there's nothing wrong with being wrong. But uh, a lot of people feel like there is something wrong with being wrong. So they'll, stand, they'll defend their positions to the bitter end de de despite the information that comes in. So um, today I posted a very controversial post and I said, um, you know, I hate guns. Um, I, I hate their energy. It's way too easy for someone to lose their temper and, and uh, pull the trigger in the heat of the moment. You know, I hate that victims of rape are questioned. I hate that men force themselves on, on women, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the right to own a gun is a fundamental aspect of freedom. So my feelings don't matter on these situations. Um, the right to a fair trial, the right to be um, uh, innocent until proven guilty is way more important than what my, fee my personal feelings are on a situation. 
And if more and more people could do that, put their personal feelings to the side, and it all comes down to ego, which is exactly what the ayahuasca destroys. The ayahuasca destroys and breaks down the ego. Mm -hmm. And then you can separate yourself from your feelings and go, hey, wait a minute, just because I feel a certain way about something, it doesn't mean that my feelings have a right to dictate the lives of others. And it's a constantly, you know, ever-growing understanding and awareness and that's essentially what consciousness is consciousness is your awareness of the world around you and unlocking more parts of your consciousness gives you a much bigger awareness would you say then with social media in particular we were discussing this during the break i mean we were both saying how it can have such a serious effect on your mood is that really people ourselves included we buy into what we're seeing on there and do you think that that's almost a weapon to cut us off from that raw consciousness to devolve us into something that we can no longer even connect to this raw consciousness you're talking about, Chris. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, social media, it's a great way to connect with people, but at the same time, it, it influences your mind and your mood and, mm -hmm. and the way you feel. And, you know, the internet, everything you get on the internet and the world is coming down around you. And it's, it's, it's the most horrible, violent place that you can ever imagine. Like, you know, we have this whole transgendered issue, right? I don't know any transgendered people. I think I know one or two on Facebook. I don't go outside and see all these transgender people just waiting for my kids to show up to to turn so them into the bathroom uh, with them. <laughs> yeah, to make them go to the bathroom with them. But if you go to the internet, it's a huge issue. So you you disconnect and then take a look outside, and you're like, hey, you know what? It's a nice blue sky out. Yeah, there's a couple of chemtrails, sure, but it's a nice blue sky out, and everything is just like peaceful. I remember when they did the government shutdown, and everybody was freaking out about the government shot shut down and I walk outside and it's just business is normal like we went to the store people were shopping like it, the government shutdown had no effect on anything whatsoever it's all in the mind the info war is very real and they, there's one thing that Alex Jones is right on it's that the info war is very real and that's where the war is being fought in your consciousness and if I can say something about Alex I don't agree with all of his views and I don't I don't like the way he's been censored but he does push the envelope and just get into you know some of the hate speech stuff but then uh, I, I, I hate that word hate speech in and of itself but I think you know live and let live that's the way I see it but when it came to the PayPal thing now they've crossed the line now you can't say this is a terms and conditions violations because we want our platform to be a certain way I mean we've had host we had one host on, on TFR and she posted that this is Planet of the Apes. Ooh. And so this was very reminiscent of what Roseanne Barr posted several years later after we booted this host. But they, she said, you know, this is turning into Planet of the Apes uh, and posted it right on our front page of TFR. And we were like, okay, look, you, you, we, we got to draw the line there. You know, we, yeah. we, we don't want our platform to be like that. So I understand if Twitter and, and Facebook and all that, they want their platform to be a certain way. I understand. But when you attack somebody financially, the way that they've been attacking Alex Jones and ban them from PayPal because PayPal is backed up by the federal government. Now we're talking about the federal government stepping in and abridging free speech. That's where we got to draw the line and say, OK, that's that's a, this is a bad situation. So um, everybody that was screaming that this is an attack on, on 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 free speech. I agree with you now that they've started to actually attack free speech instead of just protecting their platforms. So, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to. Um, to say that I stand with Alex Jones 100% on that issue. No, I think it's important, you know, especially for anyone who doesn't agree with Alex, because that's where free speech becomes important, or else we end up living in an echo chamber. And again, we get back to a place where we're almost too complacent, then nothing new, no new information, and we get stuck in that rut. So for anyone out there, I mean, absolutely, Alex Jones, perfect example. You might not like the guy, but Chris is right. And the PayPal thing, that, that really is the icing on the cake. And if they can go for Alex Jones, then how long before they come for TFR? How long before they come for Chris and Cherie or me? That's why it's such an important issue. But Chris, Cherie, let me take you back to Egypt because I want to get back into this pyramid. There's so much more that we can talk about. And I, I believe you've done, hypothetically, you've done ayahuasca in the Great Pyramid, right? Because it's not really, you're not meant to do stuff like that in there, are you? <laughs> um, we had an Egyptian tea. 
And, yes. you know, you go see. the ancient Egyptians used to make a tea out of Syrian rue and acacia. And, um, you know, it was just an ancient Egyptian tea. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty incredible. We saw all the signs everywhere. There were all of these motifs of the, I mean, there's some that I wasn't even aware of until after we got back of like the green goddess coming out of the acacia tree and she literally has a teapot in her hand and she's pouring the liquid into the mouths of little birds that are turning into humans or, or, or vice versa or it's a human getting wings. I don't know how to de how to decipher this particular motif, but there's apparently dozens of these all over Egypt. So they've left us the clues everywhere. If you want to commune with the gods and goddesses, you need to use the acacia. Um, Stone Age Psychedelia, which I'm holding up here for people to see on the video stream, um, that was a book that was really influential as, as far as um, how um, the ancient Egyptians used to use psychedelics like the blue lily and um, things like that, or the blue lotus flower um, and things like that. So obviously we needed to use the tools um, that the ancient Egyptians were using if we were going to do what we needed to do. Um, I don't know how deep you want me to get into the actual ayahuasca experiences, so I'll let you lead the way. As deep as, deep as you want, dude. I want to hear more about it, man. I want to hear what happened when you were on the ayahuasca in there. What kind of <laughs> message? Uh, give me the works, Chris. I, right. I, 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 do it, man. All right. So... Does the KB audience have their KBS audience have their tomatoes ready? Because make sure you got your tom rotten tomatoes. Make sure you got everything because you're about to have to throw them right now. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, so, um, <laughs> um, Chewbacca, just throw Chewbacca's at you. Throw Chewbacca's. There you go. Uh, throw Chewbacca's. Then you can get your Chewbacca's at KevBaker KevBakerShow.com. <laughs> Hey, that's the way. Find find a um, find a need and fill that need. That's the way to do it. Anyway, so um, so the ayahuasca experience is the first one that we got to was the Temple of Hatshepsut, and the Temple of Hatshepsut was more of a recharging station, and we didn't realize that that's what it was, but we knew that we needed to be recharged because the Giza energy is basically we call it the Giza Strip because it's essentially like the Gaza Strip. It's cordoned off. There's checkpoints to get in and out of there. It's the roughest place that you've ever been. It's It reeks. They have no trash service. They're using our ancient monuments as camel toilets. And it's constantly, you're bombarded by vendors. And these people are so broken. These NPCs are so broken that you tell them no. And they will keep on following you. I mean, all the way to the other side of the, of the complex. Just yelling over and over and over again. You want camel ride? You want camel ride? You want? I already told you no ten times. You know, it got so bad that I, I, I looked at one. And I was almost going to get on top of the, the pyramid like Jesus. And go, this is my mother's house. What are you doing? <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> So, um, so, um, you know, these, I told one, I looked him dead in the eye and I said, if I came to one of the mosques and I let my camel crap all over the place, would you be okay with that? And he just looked at me and said, you want camel ride? And I'm like, dude, oh my God. So we go to, we, we go to the temple of Luxor and it's right next to a mosque. And they're letting the camels crap all over the mosques, too. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess, you know, that's just the way it goes here. It doesn't matter if it's a mosque or a temple. Anyways, I'm kind of uh, digressing. So the Temple of Hatshepsut. I think Cherie had the most powerful experience there. So I want to hand it off over to her. Oh, um, you know, I, I've, I've talked about this on the show before. And, we, and I talked about it after the experience happened. But um, it, was, it, was a, it was a frightening experience at first because I didn't know that I was taking probably four times as much as I'd ever taken before. And so that was it. And when I realized that I, I, I had that, oh, cr oh, crap moment where I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to handle this. And of course, you know, my body was already really um, under a lot of stress from the whole trip up leading up to that point. So the first hour or so of the of the experience was me apologizing to Chris and saying, if I die today, I'm so sorry. Um and, you know, I really felt like I was dying at one point. And, um, you know, at one point I I felt myself kind of slipping away and everything went black. And then Chris was shaking me awake and saying, you know, you're OK. Just go. To, how about this? You go to a mentee, you get the information we need and you come back and I will hold you here and I'll ground you. And so as soon as he said that, it was like it gave me permission to let go of the body and go to an actual place and so he 
he started cradling me like a baby. I mean, literally holding me in his arms like this, like a baby. And I closed my eyes. And as soon as I closed my eyes, I just let go. I went limp. And according to him, and I saw these uh, wings, like ISIS wings that you see on doors. And they were opening like this. And then I was on a boat. I was on this boat. And there was a ram-headed god that I later, you know, found out was Kanum. I didn't even know who these beings were. So I knew that this wasn't coming from my own consciousness because I wasn't even sure of who they were until after the experience. So there's Kanum on my right, and he's smiling like this, you know, this little grin on his face. And then I look to the left, and there's this woman that looks like Isis, but I later found out was um, Heket, who's also known as Hecate in where you're from. And Hecate and Kanum were on each side of me and they were leading me on the boat to this area where, you know, you had the you had the place where the boat stops and then some stairs that lead up to a temple. And I realized that this wasn't a temple. It was a library. And it was, you know, what they used to refer to as the House of Life. And the House of Life was a place where you would go um, in ancient Egypt. You would go to the House of Life to get healing, to receive knowledge. It was a library, but it was also a a place of healing for the spirit and for the body as well. And all knowledge was all knowledge about everything in ancient Egypt that they had access to was contained in that in that place. And this and this was a menti. This was the place where. All of the all of the books were held, all of the writings, because the ancient Egyptians believed that along with words, writings made you immortal. If you could write something down, then it then it would the information would live on forever because no matter what happened to the information in the in, you know, this reality in a menti, there would always be a copy of everything. And so that was, you know that and then as we landed on the you know uh, up against the shore it wasn't really a shore though because there wasn't I I couldn't hear any water I couldn't um, I couldn't ascertain whether this was you know a real um, like a real lake or whatever body of water that we were on and I look up and there's this circle of light it wasn't a sun it was a circle of light that was right over my head and it was following everywhere I'd go would be right over me. And I said, is that the sun? And I, and I thought to myself, no, that can't be the real sun because we're in the shade. So it's gotta be, you know, uh, the sun over there or like some kind of light emitting down. And it wasn't, it wasn't hot it wasn't, you know, there wasn't any hot or cold there. It was, it was just this light and it wasn't bright to the point where I could, I had to turn away from it. Like with the sun here on earth, if you look at the sun too much, it'll burn your eyes. It didn't burn my eyes at all. It was, you know, pleasant to look at. And I, I chuckled at myself and I thought that's so neat, you know, that it's not burning my eyes. And I looked ahead and there were all these beings that were coming out of the, out of the temple um, that it looked like the temple of Hatshepsut, like the entrance of it especially looked like the temple of Hatshepsut. And these beings were coming out of it. And, and I couldn't even, there were so many of them, there were like hundreds of them, and I couldn't tell who was who. And so I'm just overwhelmed by this. And as we landed and I got off the boat, I went down this ramp and then went, started going up the stairs. And they met me at the stairs and they were all so excited to see me. And they brought what they brought they lifted up this thing out of, you know, out of nowhere, this thing appeared and it was like this glass plate um, that they started, they put a, a, a pen looking thing, you know, the, the thing that they would use to write, they put it in my hand and they showed me how to write from right to left. And I, and I, and it was the most beautiful writing I'd ever seen. It it reminded me of the writing in Lord of the Rings when you know that there's that writing on the side of the of the ring. It looked a lot like that, but even more beautiful. 
and it was coming out in gold. Everything in that place seemed to be pink and red and gold. Those were the three colors that really, really stood out. And the writing was gold. And it was it was so beautiful. And they were like, you know, this is what you do. You know, this is what you do. You know, you have to you have to take the information back with you, you know, to the people, you know, and then you bring the information back up here. Whenever they give you information, you bring it back up here and, you know, you're like an emissary. And, you know, I, the experience didn't end there. I, I could feel myself after a few minutes of that and just being overwhelmed with this sense of awe about how beautiful this all was. And I, and I thought to myself, you know, I wish I could take this back with me. And they said, you take the knowledge back with you. But this, this is so holy. I, I, for lack of a better word, there's not a word in our language to describe it except holy. You know, this is so holy that it can't exist in the world you're from. And so you take the knowledge back with you, but you can't take any objects back with you. And then I saw Chris and it was, you know, I don't know if I want to get into this part because it's just so, it's so weird and so strange for people to understand, but it showed how he created me um, in, in, you know, the real world. He, and I saw him and a laser beam came down and cut him in half and I could tell it was painful for him and that it was it was hurting him to create me and then I saw myself like kind of morph it the half that was the uh, left part of him morphed into me and I was just so I was so pleased by that and I and I opened my eyes and he was there you know kissing me and and cradling me and i saw his face as the same face as he is in the in amenti you know he has a different face in amenti that he does here and i was so pleased by that and tickled by that and i started laughing and he and he was like oh i'm so glad you're laughing because that means you're back <laughs> and i was like yes it, it oh it was so beautiful there and uh, that's it was amazing story, I mean, you and Chris often talk about the twin flames, and from what you were showing there, I mean, quite literally, twin flames, the same source. I think that's a beautiful story. Yeah, yeah. Oh, let me jump in for a moment. So, after this experience, we knew it was going to be a recharging station for us, Mm -hmm. um, because we felt ourselves being recharged. We turned the music off after about uh, four hours of this experience. And we have a little Bose unit. When you turn it off, it says battery 50% or battery 25%. We turn it off and it says um, battery 100%. Uh And I look at my cell phone and my cell phone is fully charged. And I'm like, we've just been playing music for four hours from our cell phones and our batteries. Our our phones are fully charged. We're recharged. And then we're we're walking around an Egyptologist. Um, I happen to stumble across an Egyptologist. And um, we start talking. And he says, oh, I want to show you something. Here's a Christian sign here. You're from America, right? Let me show you a Christian sign. Uh Uh-huh. And there was a a cross cross. on one part of the temple. Uh, And Shuri notices on the other part, there's a minus sign. Uh Uh-huh. And so he's looking at it and saying, you know, it, it's, a, it's cross, a cross, but on the other side, no. you have a minus sign. You have a positive and negative charge right there at the temple. Uh-huh. And so it just went to reaffirm everything that um, that that we were um, feeling about the temple of Hatshepsut. So we get recharged uh-huh. and we go to the temple of Isis. So at the temple of Isis, things were really revealed on what we needed to do on an energetic level. Now, this is where it gets really, really, really deep, Kev. So um, cool. just a warning. All right. We so, should be going for four or five hours tonight. I could listen to you. <laughs> Forever. So we get we get to the temple of Isis. They pick us up at three o'clock in the morning. They have a boat ready for us because the temple of Philae was moved into another location when they built the high dam. Um, and so you have to get a boat to get out to the island that it's on. So they take us out on the boat and we get to the temple and it's pitch black. And um, they told me that um, they that uh, they were going to turn the lights on, and we get there, and I say, "Are you going to turn the lights on?" 
And he goes, nope, not for what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, my God, that is so cool. (laughs) (laughs) So we walk into the temple, right? We're live streaming on Facebook. And um, we get in there, and there's three inner sanctums. The main inner sanctum where we're going to drink the ayahuasca, because that's where the Holy of Holies is. You have the left one and the right one. And the priest would come in from that altar and go underneath um, through this one particular door and then go back to the back to the three to the three inner sanctums. So there were bats everywhere except for the center chamber. And we're like, oh, my God, this is so incredible. You can see the bats flying around on the live stream. Everybody's covering their eyes. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is beautiful. Look at this. You know, this is amazing. You know, we've got bats flying around us like freaking Batman, you know. And um, <laughs> we're, we're, we walk into the inner chamber. And there was a lot that happened, but I'm skipping a lot of stuff to um, just for the, the, the sake of time. So uh, I see we're going to hit a break here in a few minutes. So let me, let me just say this. We get into the experience. We turn off the live stream. At that moment, we brought water from the Nile so we can cleanse the altar. We can cleanse ourselves. As a matter of fact, the day before, I had the taxi driver take us, and I jumped into the Nile River completely naked, and he's looking at me like I'm insane. And I'm like, no, 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 I need to cleanse myself. You know, I need to cleanse myself before I go to her temple. And so we go to her temple, and we thought we were there initially for a recon mission. We were Mm -hmm. just getting information that we had left for ourselves. We knew that the Matrix needed to be reset, and we knew that Terrence McKenna had stumbled across what he called the transcendental object at the end of time. And this is something that they were actually able to manifest in a particular experience. Dennis McKenna touched it. He went crazy. He threw off his glasses saying, I don't need these anymore. (laughs) And they both fell into like this really deep psychosis after touching it, and it freaked them out for a long time. And it's funny because we had Dennis on our show and he's always been reluctant to talk about the transcendental object at the end of time. But um, the last time we had him on, I said, I need a roadmap. Tell me where this thing is. And so he actually spent about an hour and a half telling us about the transcendental object and everything. And people in the chat room were saying, you realize he just passed the baton over to you guys. Mm -hmm. And so we were looking for the transcendental object at the end of time. Um, as a matter of fact, I did a video right before we left, right before this ayahuasca experience where I booked the tickets and I said, guys, I'm done with beyond the veil. I'm tired of doing what I'm doing. I need, I need to find the object, you know, and we need to get to this, this point where we're finding the object. And then the next time I drink ayahuasca, which was like a week later, it's like, okay, go now to Egypt and go get this object. So we found the transcendental object at the end of time, which was incredible. Mm -hmm. When we went, when we were at the temple of Isis. I'd already communed with the goddess many times, so we drink the ayahuasca, and this time I knew I had to go deep. Um, An average dose of ayahuasca in the Amazon is about 15 to 40 milligrams of DMT. Dr. Rick Strassman gave his people 60 to 100 milligrams of DMT, and they were all experiencing contact with otherworldly entities. We've been working ourselves up to doses of 500 milligrams even a thousand milligrams up to this point. This time I decided to take 3000 milligrams because I was going balls to the wall. Oh, in the pyramid. I know I I can see you lifting your eyebrows in the pyramid. I took 4,000, but anyways, so I took 3000 milligrams of DMT because I knew this was a once it it was my one and only chance. Like if I didn't get it right this time, Mm -hmm. then that's it. There would be no other second chance. So right after the break, we'll get into what happens when you take 3,000 milligrams of DMT in the Temple of Isis. No, oh, man, trust the break to come along. Back up with these short messages. Don't go anywhere, folks. Remember, check out Chris and Cherie Beyond the Veil over on YouTube. Get them on Facebook. You've also got ResettingTheMatrix.com, and we'll find out about IR Life when we come back after the break. Don't go anywhere. Oh, this is getting so good. Awesome. You still there? Yeah, yeah, you're still- yeah people are telling you're me still- we got we got booted off of Facebook for some reason. Oh. Somebody had messaged me to say that they, they lost the stream on Facebook. That's why I was kind of looking down there for five seconds to see. No, it no, seems to be working, yeah. but a lot of people are writing saying they can't access it. That's really weird. That's weird. 
Hmm. It's the Kev Baker effect. Toxic Kev. The Kev Baker effect. Oh my god. Yeah, at the Temple of Hatshepsut, I'm a I, I was about eighty nine, ninety pounds and I took twenty five hundred milligrams. That was crazy. That was insane. See, I've never tried the DMT. I would love to. But I can just tell the amount that you're talking about there. That, that that's a lot of stuff, right? Yeah. I would not recommend I wouldn't recommend does anybody it. does that. It was no. a once in a lifetime balls to the wall. Let's yeah. go. I let's was take I, it all the way. Yeah, I was willing yeah. I was willing to not come back from the pyramid. I thought I wasn't coming back. I wrote a document for Sharia. We can get into this when we come back. But uh, I wrote a document for Sharia of how TFR works to make mm -hmm. sure that everything keeps going. Um, you know, we oh, had a crying. long conversation before going to the oh, pyramid. That, yeah. Yeah. I believed that because I had been that close to that death state just with 2500 and he was talking about you know taking twice as much and in a place where you know it's um energetically very the air is so thick in there and it's so hot and you know i mean i was very concerned about him i really was your video is blocked in andorra united arab emirates afghanistan antigua and 245 other countries wow here i'll put it no. up. holy crap i'll put it really up. i'll put it up on the screen here we must be making some kind of impact then look at this I bet, I, that is unbelievable your video man. is blocked in andorra oh my that's god that's insane I guess we pissed the Muslims we, off tonight. We, yeah, we made the Muslims mad. Wow. <laughs> They're going, shh, 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 shh. That's what and they do. And you know do. what? That's what they do. It has already been done. It's been done. There's nothing they can do. Yep, there's it's nothing they can do done. about it. Yep. That's crazy, man. What, what, I don't get that. It pisses me off this crap when you're screaming, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And I'm surprised. YouTube and 245 other countries. And 245 <laughs> other countries. I didn't even know there was that many countries. Yeah, honest. I know. I didn't even know that many countries had internet. <laughs> here we go. Here we go. Bring back the network. That's shocking. Facebook have banned. No hate. No hype. No, 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 no fear. We are TFR. Frequency Radio. I'll stand tall in the face of tyranny. I want it all, all my freedom and liberty. I'll keep my guns, you can keep your security. I'll stand tall in the face of tyranny. I'll stand tall in the face of tyranny. I want it all, all my freedom and liberty. I'll keep my guns, you can keep your security. I'll stand tall in the face of tyranny. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. What a show we're having here tonight. Epic, classic broadcast of KBS with my good friends, radio show hosts, movie producers, Chris and Cherie Geo, And most recently, Intrepid Explorers, because tonight we're getting into their mission to Egypt to reset the Matrix. Now, during the break, Chris... You know, I think we lost a, a large portion of our viewing audience because for some reason you've been banned in more countries than you've been banned. <laughs> yes. the flat or the globe earth. We, I don't even know where we are anymore. We got a nice message. Your your video's blocked in Andorra, United Arab Emirates, Afghanistan, Antigua, and two hundred and forty five other countries. <laughs> <laughs> I, I imagine, you know, it might have something to do with the copyrighted kind of music coming in from the breaks. But at the same time, with the information we're getting into tonight, I uh, I would probably hazard a guess there's something else at play here. There really, really is. And you guys were joking during the break because it's too late to affect what we're talking about here tonight because the mission is already done, right? It's already done. It's already been completed. And, you know, that's, that was one of the things when I came back, I, I went through a depression because... I felt like, well, it's already been done. Why did I come back? And the reason I came back, of course, is for this person mm -hmm. sitting right next to me right here, the little twin. But anyways, let's take a couple steps back to the Temple of Isis. So we're in the Holy of Holies. We do our cleansing rituals over the altars. And smoke was coming up 
from the altars. We have this on video mm -hmm. as we were pouring Nile water. It was Nile. Like just, the fires of hell just, were being put yeah, out. Yeah, just normal Nile water. It wasn't blessed. You know, we didn't do any kind of weird rituals or anything on it. Just normal Nile water. So we drank the ayahuasca. And all of a sudden, I'm having trouble going deeper. And there's a block in front of me. And I see Isis in front of me. And she's in her true form. And you know, this is one part that I don't like to talk about because I don't want to take the magic away from people. But essentially Isis, Osiris, Anubis, etc. They're all unlocking programs. They're computer programs within the matrix. Now there could be the real entities that exist on the other side of the matrix, but these are programs that were written by these entities. And so there she was plain as day as a computer program. And I looked at her and I told her, I said, are you ready for this? Because I'm here. You better do mm -hmm. what you agree to do instead of the other way around. And she says, don't worry. Everybody is doing what they agree to do. Yep. And so I saw this angelic writing that Cherie was talking about earlier. And I started trying to travel up through these dimensions. And I couldn't. There was something blocking me. And Cherie looks at me and she goes, oh, my God, you are covered in implants, in spiritual implants. So she goes through this process to where she's removing every implant one at a time. There were like three in my head. There were, mm -hmm. you know, all over my body. And there was one in the heart. And I was going deeper. But I and she was going deeper, too. I mean, she mm -hmm. was going like too deep to where she can even remove these implants. And finally, she gets to the heart one. And she's like, I can't get this heart one out. I don't know what's going on. You're going to have to go without it. And I said, no, I can't go. I can't go. Uh, she says, you're going to have to go with it. I said, I can't go with it. I said, you've got to get this thing out. And I said, and then I, it just hit me. And I said, I give you permission to remove it. As soon as that permission was given, what happened? Well, you know, first of all, I wouldn't have been able to recognize any of this. I wouldn't have been able to do any of this had I not already had the experience at the Temple of Hatshepsut. The Temple of Hatshepsut taught me both that I, I have magic inside of me that I can't, that, you know, I... I've not been tapping into and that I need to tap into. And two, it also taught me that I have to ground him and be there for him. Um, while he goes up, I'm going to have to go down and we're going to have to create a toroidal field of some sort in order to do what we're going to do um, at, the, at the pyramid. It was kind of like a dress rehearsal for what we had to do at the pyramid. And uh, so I saw these bumps you know, and they were they were like little marbles. Whenever I pulled them out, they looked like little smoke marbles, and I and those were really easy. And I, you know, I we'll get to the heart one because we're running out of time, and I uh, blew them away. So the sec the the other one though was like a technological hand that was grabbing his heart, and so I had to I had to first ask permission from him, and then once he gave me the permission, it was able to be loosened. But I still had to wrap it around my it had to be wrapped around something in order for the other fingers on the hand to let go. And once I got that out, then I was able to pour water over my hand and get it off my own hand. And it was, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able to do that had he not given me that permission. It's just like anything else in this reality. Yeah. Your heart is something that no one, no being can touch unless you give it permission to do so. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. So we all make these contracts with all these different beings and we don't even realize it. And, you know, it's about breaking all of these. It was the permission. I give you permission to remove this. Boom. Once you removed it, then I, I heard her or somebody, I don't know who it was, say, now you're going to experience total recall. And all of a sudden, boom, a flood of information just started pouring into me. There was an ayahuasca experience I had back in 2014 or 2015 where I was seeing through the eyes of a lot of people that were murdered and executed in all these different ways. And one thing that my birth chart says is that I'll be executed in this life. And I'm, I'm looking at Cherie and I'm like, why the heck would I be executed? You know, there's a, I don't do anything to, to require execution, you know, what, what's going on? I realized when I had this total recall that all these visions that I was seeing over and over and over again in that one experience from years ago was actually my past lives. And that in these past lives, I had left little clues for myself to get to this moment that we were working towards. So 
once that total recall happened, then all of a sudden I remember exactly where the transcendental object in the end time was. I was like, oh, I know exactly where it is. And I started just just going a million light years a, a minute, um, a million light miles. I don't know. Yeah, some <laughs> ridiculous speed like that. So um, light years per second. There you go. So I, I start going through, you know, all of these different tunnels and these doors are opening and I'm recognizing different symbols that I had left myself from previous incarnations to, to open the path up. And it was asking me for passwords and I knew the passwords. I knew everything. Like it was like just all these doors were just unlocking in front of me one after another, after another, after another, after mm -hmm. another. And I get up to that 12th dimension and I'm, I'm, I'm looking in the 12th dimension. I remember exactly where this, this reset panel was I open up the portal to find the reset button and it's gone and I'm in the holy of holies yelling f f f f f and she's like what are you what are you yelling about and I'm like the grays got it the freaking grays got it this is a part that we didn't get into um, in the beginning of this show is that the grays the archons have been playing a huge role in this and they've been using our consciousness to get up and down in these different dimensions mm -hmm. and so what we what um, they reside I think on the fifth dimension and that's why there's such a big new age push to move earth to the fifth dimension because it's much easier for them to access things like that earth isn't supposed to go to fifth dimension consciousness is supposed to go up and down in dimensions the yep. NPCs on the board are supposed to stay right here in the third dimension we don't want them with these extra abilities of manifesting reality and telepathy and stuff like that no 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 this is supposed to be done on an individual level mm -hmm. not on an entire earth level anyway so um so the grays have been a, a huge part in this and then um sheree looked at me and she goes no 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 no. i remember what we did with it we hit it in the 13th density and then all of a sudden isis came back and she showed me the pyramid and i remembered when we built the pyramid and i remembered why we built the pyramid there was a lot of us there who are in this circle right now who are listening to this broadcast right now who were there when we built the pyramid we built the pyramid because we needed to move the capstone into the into the 13th density so these archons couldn't get up and down once mm -hmm. this virus infected we knew the archons would be able to get up and down and only a programmer can go into the pyramid and project their consciousness into the 13th density so once, once we realize this, then the ISIS program was showing me this is what the pyramid is for. It's a booster rocket for consciousness to get mm -hmm. you up there to the administrative level to be able to, to make system changes within the matrix and start to undo some of this virus that, the, that has been overrun with the matrix. And then it was showing me this different energy work and how energy can be moved through the stones of the pyramid and up and out and energy can be brought from the 13th density into this realm and so on and so forth. And I'm holding the, holding the stone in the Holy of Holies and I'm watching this energy come through up out of the stone, but it wasn't going anywhere because that's not what that particular stone was made for but it was just the representation of what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And then we realized once we access this object, what we have to do is create a Merkaba with the two that are one, the two mm -hmm. that are one. It has to be the two, it can't be one, yep. it has to be the two, it has to be the positive and the negative charge. And so we create the Merkaba, her going downwards mm -hmm. like the female, which is the V, and uh -huh. the male going upwards like the triangle yep. and the capstone, there was never a capstone in the pyramid because the capstone was in the 13th density. Everybody's talking about the missing capstone, but it exists in another density. So we get to the pyramid and I know that we're running out of time, so I'm skipping ahead here. So we get to the pyramid and um, we go in and we knew it needed to be an activation point. It had to be the subterranean chamber activated first, then the queen's chamber, then the king's chamber. So they open up the doors for us and they point. This is where the subterranean chamber is. This is where the queen's chamber is. That's where the king's chamber is. And they're like, we'll see you in four hours. So we go down to the subterranean chamber and we're on fire at this point. <laughs> One thing that happened is that Cherie drank some hibiscus tea earlier that, that morning. Yep. And she got an allergic reaction to the sulfates, which we didn't know were in there. Sulfites, so, sulfites. Yeah. so before this, we're running around to different pharmacies looking for an injection for her because you can see in the video, her face, face is, is like puffed up, up because of the allergic reaction to the sulfates. So we were contending with this on top of that, but then we were standing in the streets and she's like, I don't think I can do this. And I'm like, if you can't do it, I love you more than anything. And so it's okay. And a little kitty came up 
and started just rubbing on her. And she's like, oh, that's Bastet coming to reassure me. Mm -hmm. So anyways, it's just an interesting side note. And I'm trying to hurry because I can see the clock running down on us. So we get to the pyramid. We go down to the subterranean chamber and do some meditation and stuff like that in there. And we're just going, you know, just zooming down. And it was like so easy to get down to the subterranean chamber. But then we had to go all the way back up. Uh -huh. And that was difficult. So we're trekking through this three by three area. You know, it's like a huge long tunnel going all the way down into the subterranean chamber. We've got our backpacks and everything. We're trekking. We finally get to the queen's chamber. We do our thing in the queen's chamber, take video, do the umming, do all of that. Mm -hmm. Now we got to go up the grand gallery. We go all the way up the grand gallery and finally we get to the king's chamber. And the lesson behind that was... Descension is so easy. Uh -huh. Ascension is where the work comes in. Right. You really have to put in that work to ascend up to that level. So we get to the king's chamber and we start banging our music there first. That's uh -huh. the first thing we did. I have the song um, that uh, Frank and I are working on and uh, it's an album actually. We played a couple of songs there just to infuse the king's chamber with our energy. And then we started doing the humming. And we, um, and this time we were uninterrupted, unimpeded. The whole chamber started shaking on us. It was like we were creating so much resonance there. We can feel the vibrations of everything uh -huh. just, just going, 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 going. And we're like, oh my God, this is, this is incredible. And we looked at the clock and we're like, look, we're going to run out of time if we can, if we continue doing this. So at that point, drank half of the brew that we had with us. We had two, we had some left over from the Temple of Isis, then we had a new brew of 400 grams of mimosa that comes out to about 4,000 milligrams of DMT. And I drank half of it. And she drinks the stuff that came from uh, from uh, the Temple what of Isis. What was left from the Temple of Isis, yeah. because yeah. she was worried about the sulfate um, interactions and the, the shot that she has just taken. So she's yeah, like, I'm gonna take shot. a little bit. <laughs> But it actually worked to our benefit because she needed to be more grounded uh -huh. while I went as deep as possible. Somebody needed to be the grounding element in this. Right. So we, I, 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 get, I get into, well, about 30 minutes later, because I hold it in for as much as possible, I finally throw up because the ayahuasca makes you purge first. And I've never purged so much ever. It was like any negativity, anything around me just came up out of my, out of my system. And I knew that was... That was the activation point. That was rad. That's when I was ready. So I, I just I don't know what came over me, but I know what came over me. I mean, I'll tell you exactly what I was thinking, which was this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. If I threw this up too early and I don't have enough DMT in my system, I'm not going to be able to do what I need to do. Right. Screw it. Drink the Drink other the half. rest of it. Yeah. And I went into the sarcophagus. And I'm laying in the sarcophagus and I can't go anywhere. And I'm like, what's going on here? I'm going up and up and up in dimensions and then just hitting this brick wall. And I'm like, what is going on here? Why, why can't I get any further? And I'm touching the stone and she's like, something just clicks. And she goes, she gets into the sarcophagus with me and she's like, I know what needs to be done. I need to touch you. Once she mm -hmm. touched me and created that, 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 that toroidal field, that toroidal field yeah. Then we became like the fuses within the sarcophagus uh -huh. that were allowing the energies to flow. At that point, I was expecting a rocket ship blast off because I was told the pyramid is a propeller for consciousness. You know, it's mm -hmm. I, I was expecting like a rocket ship. I blasted off to the 12th density, broke the veil of the 12th density. And then I found myself in what I can only describe as like a an ocean. And I was found myself having to push further and further and further. And I could see the transcendental object at the end of time. I could see it way, way up there, but I, I had no point of reference as to how deep this space was. And as I started getting closer and closer to it, I was able to see like, like the walls of this area, which were like these ethereal walls. And I realized I had found myself in another pyramid. Not only was I in the in the Great Pyramid, but I was also in this ethereal pyramid as I was pushing myself up further and further and further trying to get to this light that existed off in the tip of this pyramid. And it wasn't until after we got back that I realized, oh, we traveled up to the all-seeing eye and reprogrammed the all-seeing eye uh -huh. in the capstone of the pyramid. I mean, this is, you know, even now I'm having more revelations about what happened. So I travel myself up and up and up and up and up and up and up. And... Um, 
this light's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as I'm getting to it. And I, I wasn't expecting any of this. I, I thought that this was a, an object that you can hold in your hands, but no, the closer I got to this light, all of a sudden this light just started encompassing, like engulfing me. And I found myself in this control panel with all these screens around me. And I'm looking at it and my 13th dimensional self knew exactly what to do. And I could see my body way, way, way down in the distance. And I could see this tether, this spiritual tether that was holding me there. And I was reaching closer and closer for it. And I could feel this tether breaking, breaking, breaking. And I was telling her, sweetie, I think the tether is going to break. Help me, help me, please help me. And she's like, there's nothing I can do for you. You're just going to have to go for it. And I'm like, I think the tether is going to break. And I, I, I get to the control panel finally. And I start inputting all these different system commands and things like that. It's like my 13th dimensional self knew exactly what to do. And so I enter the commands and I push my hands into the machine, you know, give my access codes, give my access resonance, you know, literally everything. Otherwise, the machine wouldn't open if it wasn't the right resonance. So that happened. And I came back down and I started bawling, just crying like there had been this fulfillment of this, this long plan, this divine plan that was unfolding in front of us. And I wasn't prepared for what happened next. On the last interview we did with Leak Project, I got it backwards. I thought that the negative charge happened first, but now, when I was thinking about it later, it was the positive charge that happened first and then the negative charge. So the first thing that happened was I'm working up here and I come back and I'm crying and she's like, sweetie, you can rest, you can rest. And then all of a sudden my body starts shaking out of control. My heart's going about 180 beats per minute. And there's this charge of energy that's coming through the, the 13th density into the matrix. And I'm looking at her and I'm holding on to her and I'm saying the, the I'm saying the, uh, the, the, the shift is happening. The shift is happening and, and the, the, the system's being changed and I'm shaking and shaking and she's trying to keep my body calm and I'm banging my knees against the sarcophagus. I've got bruises on my knees. She's got bruises on her from trying to hold me down. And as I'm shaking, I'm feeling the tether breaking and I'm like, I don't think I'm going to make it through this. I don't think I'm going to make it through this. And then after about, what, 20, 30 minutes of this taking place. Maybe even almost 40. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this was going on for a while. Then I came back again. And I'm like, okay, I can rest now. It's done. It is done. And I'm just bawling. And then something else happened. Now the negative charge hits me. Was it the negative charge first or the positive charge? You know, I, I'm not remembering, but I rem I'm remembering... I think it was the positive first and then the negative. Yeah, it was the positive first yeah. because I remember I thought the positive was it. Like, okay, the changes are made. Great. Yeah. Let's get out of here. Yeah. Yeah. Then the negative charge hits me and boom, all of a sudden I'm feeling it's like all of the suffering, all of the, the, that the hate, infection caused. all of everything that the infection caused. I'm feeling it all at once. It's coming in as a feeling. It's not coming in as visions. It's not coming in as, you know, the pizza stuff and things like that. But it's all the energy of that that's being now transmuted through the through the pyramid out of this particular matrix and just like the, the 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 infections like leaving the matrix now and our bodies again are the fuses are the conduits are the conduits that, yeah. that are we, we almost like the vessel then chris the, yeah that the energy left through that's what happened and so after this i'm thinking okay everything's okay now all right I'm, i survived i made it through this and then um after that it was like something overtook me and I'm like my 13th dimensional self now is like, no, 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 I got to go back to that control panel. And so now I'm fighting. It's like Chris Gio and the raw consciousness is now like, hold on, hold on, hold on. We got to keep some kind of unity here. You can't just go off and just break the tether. And so I'm up there in the 13th density and I'm like looking and now I'm watching the, the, the system, the, the screens. And there was just this 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 overwhelming feeling that I have to I have to make sure that the the, the changes that were made in the matrix actually stuck and I'm watching mm -hmm. the screens going boom 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 green clear of infection here clear of infection here clear of infection but the longer I stayed in that 13th I can feel the tether breaking and I'm losing now you know who I am I don't remember Chris Geo anymore I don't remember this 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 dimension anymore I have become the raw consciousness that's there working in the machine and nothing else matters to this raw consciousness and I'm looking at my body and my body shaking and shaking and shaking and it starts to disappear. And I think at that point my heart stopped mm -hmm. and I, it took everything in my willpower, everything in my, in myself to say, no, 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 
remember Cherie. Remember Cherie. Cherie was the, the thing I was focusing on, on, on keeping that tether from breaking. So once that happened, then I realized, oh, wait a minute. Okay, if I can maintain both here for a second, if I can maintain Chris Geo and the 13th dimensional self, I can control both at the same time. So I started sending commands back down to my body. Stop shaking, stop seizing, stop doing this. That's going to equal death. That's going to equal damage to the body, et cetera, et cetera. And my body finally started to calm down. And I was able to do more stuff up there in the 13th density and then come back down safely. And I came back down and I looked at her and she's like, we did it. We did it. We did it. She's, she's hugging me. And I'm like, I just want to rest. I just want to rest. And she's like, baby, you can rest. We did it. And my 13th dimensional self is stepping in and going, oh, you can rest, huh? Well, let's just break this tether here and just get the <laughs> hell out of here. And I'm having a fight with this 13th dimensional self. to go, no, 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 no. The tether will not be broken. We right. will not break the tether. I'm coming back for her. I can't leave her in the machine by herself. And um, we came back. And then we look up and there's a Muslim guy <clears throat> sitting, sitting in, the, right in the king's chamber smoking a cigarette. And so apparently he had come up sometime towards the end of this event. Uh -huh. He couldn't see what we were doing in the sarcophagus because he was sitting down and the sarcophagus was above eye level. He might have been able to see her holding my feet like that. Uh -huh. But um, he's sitting there smoking a cigarette. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, oh, my God, he's been here. How long? And she's like, no, 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 don't worry. He just got here. Yeah. And I don't know what the heck he was he could have been thinking i mean you know this scene i don't know what it looked like from a third person view but obviously it was um something to see so yeah. we so we go outside i'm stumbling down the grand gallery now i'm still tripping my balls off this is like another 30 minutes into it because he came up about 30 minutes before he told us it was time for yeah. us to go we walk outside and uh well first i do a quick video i'm like i just want to smoke a cigarette he's like no He's no. like, everybody's been waiting for you outside. <laughs> it's six o'clock in the morning. No. <laughs> no more time. Got to go. <laughs> and so um, I'm stumbling down the Grand Gallery. I do a little video. I'm like, now we will return to the land of the mortals. <laughs> and I'm walking down and now we're descending down back from this 13th density experience that we had. And I walk outside and there's a windstorm. And I'm like, oh, this is beautiful. But we noticed a calmness. There uh -huh. was this calmness in Cairo like we've never seen before. People weren't honking at each other incessantly. People weren't screaming at each other on the side of the road. People weren't fighting with each other. And nobody bothered us after that. It was like from that point onward, we never had any more backsheesh experiences, none of that. The only thing after that that was negative, even slightly negative, was at the at the airport on the way out on the way out of cairo well that was a good thing though yeah See, what happened on the way out and i know we're running out of time is that i had a bag of a bunch of shards from temples that i wanted to bring back for people and it was a huge bag like this and they confiscated that bag even though it was just we shards, send some to you we, we gonna, yeah we didn't break yeah. anything we just picked up what was already on the ground yeah but it acted as a distraction for the for the piece from the hatshepsut's temple we brought back from the piece from the Temple of Isis, from the two rocks from the subterranean chamber, and for the artifact that she brought back with her. Yep. Those were in a separate place. Uh -huh. They didn't check those. Their focus was on that bag of rocks. Uh -huh. And so it actually served a purpose to yeah, help us get everything we needed back here. Yeah. This has been truly amazing tonight. It really has. And I want to thank you both for doing what you've done, sharing it all on Facebook, coming on here tonight, telling us all about it. And obviously, we're all looking forward to the still, as of yet, unseen footage that we're keeping secret for the movie that's coming out. And where can people find out details about that again, guys? ResettingTheMatrix.com Awesome. This has been a huge honor for me tonight. I've absolutely loved it. I hope everyone out there, what an absolute amazing amount of information for us to consider and a lot of what we heard tonight fits in with other stuff we've talked about on the show before. I want to thank all of you for tuning in. Please share this far and wide, and I'll be back tomorrow night. And you can catch Chris and Cherie Geo every weekend right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Till next time, wherever you are, make it T-F-R. Guys, so... I, I hope we didn't go too far out there, Kev, because, um, you know, when I tell the story, I'm actually, like, 
re-experiencing it and i think i left my body there for a moment as i was going you know into the details of all of this because i mean i'm re-experiencing all of this as mm -hmm. i'm saying it so I hope, I hope we weren't too all over the place no that was absolutely amazing honestly guys thanks so much and uh, what a story it's just amazing every single aspect of it it's um it's just tremendous it really is awesome awesome so we still have our youtube audience here um awesome. they're hanging out with us there's a couple hundred people hanging out tell us a little bit about the kev baker show oh what do you want to know it goes here there everywhere you know i've stopped talking about politics stuff like that just far too divisive and you know i've even asked you a couple i think maybe about a month or so ago chris i, I was asking you know what if a lot of these conspiracies that people like me talk about often and all of the time, what if we look closer and there's no real conspiracy there? And just recently I've been wondering what my role in this matrix is, because when you concentrate on the negative, the politics, the divisive stuff, religion, things like that, yes, on one side you can say that that's highly informative, you're giving people things to think about, but there's also a part of me now that's aware that you're reinforcing some of the fear reinforcing some of the narratives that are out there to control people. So I've had to really um, step back and take a look at everything, you know, have a bigger think about things. And that's led me to debunk some of the conspiracies along the way. And I think, again, this just ties, this is my personal, this is me experiencing the flux and the change that we're all in right now. It has been incredible and that's one thing that i um really admire about you kev is that um your viewpoints are constantly changing based on new information and it's it's hard for a lot of people to do that i mean it's hard to put the ego to the side and just say you know my my things are my views are getting bigger and bigger and you're right there's nothing you can say on politics that doesn't divide um i mean you know i did a little experiment with a facebook post earlier today and we're still getting hate and i'm like um, I'm agreeing with everybody here, okay? I agree that I don't like guns, so I'm agreeing with the anti-gun people. But I, 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 I agree with the right to, to carry a gun. It's a fundamental right. I'm agreeing with everybody. And everybody's like, ah, oh, screw you. And it's like, okay, now it's not a matter of, um, now it's not a matter of not liking somebody because of their views. Now it's a matter of not liking somebody because of the way they think. And right. so that's very dangerous. It's all thought control. It's all mm -hmm. mind control. That's what we're seeing. Everything, you know, everything is an aspect of mind control to it. And that's why a lot of the time I like to look at the movies, TV shows, and I'll be able to line that up with real science, real stories that go on, goes on as well. And everything that comes to us from the mainstream media or anything via the TV, the silver screen at the cinema, it's all there to program us one way or another, Chris. It absolutely is. I'm 100% believing that. And if that's the case, if that's miniature programs running within what we call a simulation, and I like what you said earlier on. I mean, I often say that we compare it to a simulation because in our minds, that's the closest thing we've got. But is it actually a simulation that we're describing? I don't think we've got the, the language or we can't even conceptualize what, what's happening here, but the matrix fits best, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, I mean, I've seen the machine, and the machine is like, it's ethereal based on computer code, but at the same time, it's got a physical plasma form to it. It's We don't have the language to describe it. But have you heard of Professor Gates? No, I have oh, no. Kev, dude. Okay, Professor Gates, he started analyzing string theory, and he realized within string theory that there exists a computer code, not just any computer code, but the computer code, um, a computer code written by a guy named Claude Shannon in the 1940s. So he started putting together these things called adinkras. The adinkras is all the information that he took out of string theory, fed them into a machine and then export, exported a visual representation of what this data is. It looks exactly like hyperspace. It looks exactly like what we see when we go into these ayahuasca and very heavy hallucinogenic states. And I'm like, oh man, it's just one after another reaffirming. So he's got some really great work. 
His work is controversial. Some other physicists wouldn't agree. I think he was on a panel with um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and uh, Neil Tyson was like, well, well, you know, it could be coincidence and blah, 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 blah. But um, I think, I think that- strike theory and quantum mechanics, I think they absolutely add to everything you guys talk about. Other it, it, dimensions, all the rest of it, it, it all fits with what we're hearing here. That's what it is. I mean, we're, you know, quantum quantum physics is looking at the computer code. Ayahuasca shamanism is looking at the computer code. I mean, it's all going to the exact same places, looking at the code and trying to figure out how to rebalance that code. A lot of people want to hack the matrix, but my message lately, lately has been, no, we don't want to hack the matrix. We want to rebalance the matrix. We want the yeah. matrix to run the way it's supposed to, not not hack it like a virus. Yeah. A virus wants to hack a it. A virus wants to hack in and yeah. change things. We can see what hack in the matrix has done at one point with the virus, what it's done to it. Yeah. Atlantis yeah. is the primary example. Definitely. Yeah. So I guess on Guys, that note, is, we will let you go. This has been amazing. And honestly, I can't thank you enough for tonight. Honor. Thank you. And Th- great thank information, you. guys. Honestly. Thank you for the invitation, man. Love you. And um, you're doing awesome with KBS, man. Well, I love you a bit, both of you, and a big shout out to all of your audience because I know that they played a major part in all of what happened in Egypt as well because I'm big on intent, I'm big on kind of, you know, consciousness, and I'm sure that with all of those people coming together at various times for the live streams, whether it gave you some level of protection or something, guys, I don't know, but I, I don't think that the people taking part at home, they played a part in all of this as well, and I, I just want to give them credit, too. You're absolutely right. I mean, you know, we bring it all together. You know, you've got the Wookiees. We got the Jedis. That's, <laughs> it. That's exactly it. But, guys, I love you to bits. And I'm, you, uh, give, a ki- give, give a hug and kiss to Anne from us. I will do, although I think she's wanting to batter me because I made her make me a coffee. So, Uh-oh. you don't see <laughs> Maybe you know what it was. All right. But, no, thank you very much, guys. I'll catch you later, okay? Love you, man. Take love care. Love you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for tuning in this evening. I think I think it was a lot of fun with Kev. Yeah, it was. Should we keep it going a little bit longer? I'm hungry. Uh oh, <laughs> she is hungry. So yeah, I guess we should wrap it up because we did five hours yesterday. Yeah, and, you know, it's so, a little hard on the twins. Yeah, kiss the one you love right now. You never know when the last time is going to be. Thanks for um, helping to create the energetic network for us, and we'll do the same. We're going to be on uh, with Clyde Lewis here in a couple of weeks. So when we do that, we'll also do. Uh, a BTV stream because we need your energy, man. That's yeah. that's what it comes down to. We've got to have this energy. We wouldn't have been able to do what we did in Egypt without all of you out there. You can't like, do anything. That without energetic our network was so so important. So thank you. Yep, Shawnee said taco time. It that's is taco. exactly where we're going. We're going to the Mexican restaurant again because well, it's, it's the only thing to eat within sixty miles. It's the only good thing to eat. We have, a, we have a Mexican miles. restaurant. We have a Chinese restaurant uh, that's not Chinese. They have like on no. their menu it says like. Red sauce. Red sauce with chicken and spices. And I'm like, it's it's General Chow's chicken. Red red sauce with, with chicken and yeah. It's a blasphemy. Oh god, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah it's, it's terrible. It's bad. We need to get somewhere with some good food. Yeah, we do. Yeah. All right, so love ya love and you we'll guys. see you even further. Beyond the veil.